Wolfling's Harry, and how the French royalty all aspired to cosplay Rapunzel. A tale originating from 6th century Paris, France is about two princes who were going to ascend to the throne. They were kidnapped and the queen consort was given the choice, allow her grandson's hair to be cut or let them die with their luscious locks intact. She chose the sword over the scissors. One of the princes does manage to escape and he cuts his own hair and becomes a monk. In modern times, saying alright kill him instead of a haircut does sound crazy, but back then men who had long hair showed their power and wealth. According to the Byzantine poet historian Agathias, it is the rule for Frankish kings to never be shorn. Indeed, their hair is never cut from childhood on and hangs in abundance on their shoulders. Their subjects have their hair cut round and are not permitted to grow it further. In Germany, men also typically wore their hair long, but they would tie it up in a bun or on the top of their head and sometimes hide it under a fancy hat. In general, dark ages were a time where women did rarely cut their hair and there wasn't really any time period where short hair for women was trendy then. Lower class women typically wore their hair up in braids and buns because it was easier for them to work with, while upper class women got to style their hair with more intricate processes, using ribbons and metallic wires to help keep their braids and buns in place, like a Leia. On the other end of the spectrum, however, bold is punishment. To address why the grandmother would allow her grandson's death before a haircut, in today's world men shave their heads for all sorts of reasons. They could be naturally losing their hairline, have alopecia, or they're just prone to hair loss. However, in medieval times, hair was considered a symbol of power for royal men, as explained. Royal men never cut their hair, so the longer the locks, more powerful you're supposed to be. So as a man, if you let go of your hair, this was a huge sign of humility. If the grandsons from the first story had returned with shorn hair but are meant to be the throne's heirs, they would make the throne look weak and susceptible. Only monks would shave their heads, leaving a narrow strip of hair horizontally around. Other times, only in the middle of a man's head was shaved and the rest was left alone. And of course, as you may know well from our other Dark Age videos, head shaving for women during this time was a degrading punishment, as a woman's long hair was meant to be her most seductive feature. We talked about one type of head hair, let's travel down to the other, bearded baddies. Recently, beards have made a huge comeback, especially now among the young generations thanks to throwback fashion. Studies have shown that people also associate a man with a beard as being more intelligent, and many people find them to be incredibly attractive. Also, nothing is cooler than the giant dude with the bald head and like the big ass beard, you know, let's be real. Respect for beards though is nothing new. During medieval times, knights were known to grow their beards as a sign of honor, and if one man touched another man's sign of honor, well, it was enough of an insult to challenge them to a duel to the death. Now, shaving was common during the Middle Ages. Commoners would be clean shaven for the most part. Royalty was also usually shaven or had a very trim beard that was kept neat and tidy. Hilariously, however, this is kind of how barbers get started. Back in medieval times, mirrors were very small and cloudy, so they're not reliable. They were also only available to the upper class. On top of that, razors as we know them today didn't exist, so if you want to shave, you need to use one of those dangerously long razor blades. So most folks would visit the local barber surgeon for a Sweeney Todd style lineup. As we mentioned earlier, monks had shaved heads and no beards, so they took turns shaving one another as a community. And speaking of faces, the Dark Ages were surprisingly skincare obsessed. Vikings are remembered as some of the most hygienic of historical people, and they were reported to have the best practices of personal hygiene in the early Middle Ages especially. Most notable was the near daily bathing they did in the cold waters of fjords and rivers. They used combs made out of ivory or innate wood carvings, and they practiced braiding their hair for prestige and ranking. The daily practice of bathing and personal hygiene actually was what spared the king of Poland from an outbreak of plagues that had been seen in Europe. Meanwhile, in England, bathing was not as common as it is today and it was often reserved for special occasions. People would usually wash their hands and faces regularly, however. The ideal woman in the Middle Ages had that pale, smooth skin without any pockmarks or blemishes. Nearly everyone washed their face with cold water at the end of the day, even if they wouldn't wash the rest of themselves for inexplicable amounts of time. Some women used ointments made of animal fat in order to keep skin soft and smooth. And crystal girlies, even back then, people believed in the power of gemstones to heal. Women would lick amethyst and rub it over their pimples to make it go away. But rest assured, when it's bath time, you were naked in a crowd. In many Middle Age cultures, public bathing was commonplace. The Romans, Egyptians, Greeks, they were especially known for their bathhouses. And in the spring and summer, commoners could be spotted using streams and rivers to take a bath on a nice warm day. Back then, this wasn't seen as being indecent or strange. Water was scarce, and the process of heating a bath 
bath was time consuming and expensive. So it was also common to share bath water among a lot of people and be less wasteful. However, people are still humans after all, so like teens at a pool party, public bathing became associated with a certain level of sensuality. Seeing as this was a time period where intercourse was usually in hearing or seeing range of your imminent direct family, it's not a surprise this happened, let alone the fact nobody actually cared if it was. Well, except the church. They threw a bunch of laws around to try and limit that crap, but that's always what they've done. Anywho, in Japan, they still continue the tradition of public bathing in hot springs to this day. However, they have the option to segregate when men from women, so it's not as often that people leave the public bathhouse to hook up nowadays. Not to get you guys too excited either, but face washing brought in controversial hand washing. Contrary to popular belief, some groups of the medieval people actually wash their hands multiple times a day. Jewish people in particular made sure to wash their hands before eating, and Christians adopted the same practice. But even unreligious peoples would sometimes wash their hands after eating, since a lot of people didn't own utensils, and wiping your hands on fabric ain't always gonna do it. Case in point, honey garlic wings. In upper class families, guests specifically were always requested to wash their hands by pouring water out of a pitcher called an aquamanil, which was poured over a basin. These aquamanils were often in the shape of lawn, or people or mythical creatures. However, no one was washing to the extent of using soap for 20 seconds. The water in these small pitchers needed to be shared among a large group of people. So people in the Middle Ages simply splashed water on their hands before drying and poured the dirty water right back in to wash someone else's fingers later. But you'd think that soap would be involved, especially because endless people essentially had a dark age Etsy store. Today, soap is made out of essentially the same products every time. Back in the Middle Ages though, people used a lot of different substances in a cold like witches making a potion just trying to produce some semblance of soapy stuff that don't smell bad. Most successful was a combination of lime, wood ash, lard and oil. Black soap, aka soft soap, gets its name from the dark color of the wood ash lye used to make it, and the cast iron it was often boiled in. Hard soap was made with high quality barilla ashes, which creates a light colored lye. Therefore, white soap quickly became equated with high quality hard soap. The stiff soap was then molded into cakes and bars, added dried flowers to the outer side, and the quality and scent of the soap changes depending on how wealthy someone is. Unfortunately, Casey didn't catch the keyword in there a few times, folks made soap with lye, which is so harsh it can remove skin if you scrub a little too hard. Next is how the world could have had toilet paper faster if they weren't judgy wipers. China had toilet paper figured out as early as the 6th century, making small squares of rice paper that would decompose into the ground and take the feces with it. Pretty eco-friendly stuff. However, the Europeans found this to be horrifying because they thought it was disgusting that the Chinese only wiped without actually washing their backside with water. Me Meanwhile, in Europe, they're using a communal sponge on a stick that sat in a bucket of water that wouldn't be changed all day, so please tell me which is more unsanitary and horrifying. In medieval Europe, people sometimes used devices called gonfus, or a gonf stick, as well as a torchicule, or a torch cut. The gonf sticks were sponges on a stick as described, where the torchicule was anything to wipe the bottom, like straw, or moss, or leaves, or wood, you know, the basics. Who has time to care about eye bags, though? when you're walking around wearing a gag preventer nose bag. Even though medieval people clean their bodies a, a little bit more than you'd imagine, that doesn't mean the towns were sparkling clean. When you stepped outside, you came face to face with human waste, rotting food, and trash riddled streets. Horses regularly relieved themselves on the street, as did the live animals in the markets, and so did the people. Also, animals just kind of died in places and people would leave them there. Add in the smell of mold from straw houses and the smell of diseased human or animal skin, and sometimes even corpses, these bad smells were at their worst in cities and large towns. Things were so incredibly smelly, people nearly gagged, especially when it all began to bake under the hot summer sun and heat. So in order to combat the smell, some people wore nose bags, which were fabric-like masks that were filled with flowers and other fragrances that would be able to help the stomach smell the streets filled with waste. Men and women would put noses in the nose bag, give them a huff, and life is good again. The lesson here, be thankful for breeze and use it. And of course, the weirdest for last, the ear spoon. Sounds promising, doesn't it? While nowadays people use q-tips to clean your ears, which apparently we aren't even supposed to be doing, as cringeworthy as it sounds, people use long wooden or metal spoons called ear spoons or ear picks to remove the wax. Ear picks were also frequently made of bone, ivory, and brass as purely utilitarian items. Archaeologists have found them amongst the Vikings primarily, where it was common for them
them to carry an ear spoon on a chain around their neck so that they never have to be without their little tool should they ever have to degunk themselves. Ear spoons were used by all levels of society in medieval and post medieval England following the Tudors. The 17th century English knew about plaque, which they called scale, and they were encouraged by their doctors to scrape their teeth frequently. So these little doodads expanded to include that purpose. And how could I not mention that while a tailor normally would use beeswax to coat thread and make it stronger and easier to use, with no bees available, earwax would do. As gross as it may seem to us today, earwax was worth saving and selling. A steal for number 10. I mean, if we're gonna defend Pedro the Cruel, he was obliged to defend his throne against his father's uh, 10 illegitimate sons. On the other hand, they wouldn't have had so much more support from the people than the king himself if Pedro hadn't outraged his people with arbitrary killings, drama, and rules, as well as the pretty cheap treatment of his wife Blanche, the sister of the king of France. His father, Alfonso, had ditched his wife, Pedro's mom, Maria of Portugal, for his mistress once Maria had produced their son. Exiled away from court, Pedro grew up listening to his mother's hatred for his father, yet when he took the throne, he did an almost exact rinse and repeat. Pedro publicly marries Blanche, despite already having secretly wed one of his mistresses, and he abandoned and imprisoned her very shortly after. Basically, if someone looked sideways at him, Pedro had them killed. He inaugurated his reign in 1350 by killing supporters of his half-brothers, and also had his father's mistress killed for his mother. He was said to have killed a man for looking at him wrong way, and burned a woman alive for rejecting his advances. Pedro's new son-in-law, Edward the Black, got blessed with a large gem that he had obtained by robbing and killing a guest in his own house. He also put a hit out on Blanche in the end, and she died via crossbow to the eye. And of course, needless to say, Pedro killed as many of his own half-brothers as he could get his hands on, primarily through various forms of deceit. On to number 9, which is Charles of Navarre, who can also be called the Double Crosser's Double Crosser. See, Charles came from a branch of French royalty that had renounced its claim to the throne, but clearly Charles did not share that sentiment. He is crowned in 1349 and was driven by revenge and a disproportionate sense of entitlement, quickly earning himself the nickname Charles the Bad, as he attempted to expend Navarre's territory into France and Spain via schemes, plot, and deception. Ultimately, he failed and ended up marginalized and alone. In the words of historian Barbara Touchman, Charles was volatile, intelligent, charming, violent, cunning as a fox, ambitious as Lucifer, and more truly than Byron, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. His only constancy was hate. One of Charles's first targets was King Jean II's favorite minister, whom he had killed by thugs. Over the next three decades of the Hundred Year War, as France contested with England for control over territory on the continent, Charles changed sides so quickly and so often that it made everyone's head spin, and making contradictory deals with each side of a conflict at the same time. He attempted one coup and twice tried to poison the king in like a real life Game of Thrones fashion. And trust me, there's a lot of old nobility stories like this one. So if you're interested in hearing more of them, I recommend you take a moment to subscribe to The Hive. Edward III is on our countdown at number 8, and he pulled a total King David. He sent his homie, Earls of Salisbury, to go fight wars in foreign countries so he could go try to bang the Earl's wife on the sly. However, the Countess refused the King's slick idea, but Edward didn't accept that answer and returned after dark. He tells the valets to quote, nothing must interfere with what he was going to do on pain of death. Contemporary accounts from the time, of which there are five parts, detail how the Countess was left in an absolutely horrific state. And by the time her husband returns, she's fallen into a deep depression and admits to her husband what has happened. The Earl goes into a blind rage, understandably, and goes straight to Edward, who was holding court at the time. In front of dozens of witnesses, the Earl confronts his once friend, saying, You have villainously dishonored me and thrown me in the dung, and continues to tell Edward that his actions were so disgusting and inhuman that he could no longer live in the same country with the monstrous king and then just left England forever. As for the Countess Alice, all we know of her her fate is that the Earl made sure she had an independent income and was returned to her family's care before he left. You learn this story young, it's number 7, King John, aka the Magna Carta King, and one of the worst if not the worst King of England. John's offenses are almost too long to list, even before he was king the bugger was on some BS. When his older brother Richard the Lionheart was away on a crusade, John attempted to seize the throne by plotting with the King of France, Philip Augustus. Ironically, all those years later when John is finally king, he starts his 
his reign with the greatest dominion in Europe, England, large parts of Wales and Ireland, also Normandy, Brittany, Anjou, and Aquitaine. Yet within five years, he had lost all, almost all three continental territories to Philip Augustus. This loss of continental inheritance was an embarrassment and John was determined to win it back. Unfortunately, he was not competent at warfare and the attempts dragged on and drained the bank accounts. To quote Magna Carta.com, to raise the massive armies and fleet this enterprise would require, he wrung unprecedented sums of money from England. Taxes were suddenly demanded on an almost annual basis, nobles were charged gargantuan sums to inherit their lands, and the lands of the church were seized, and the Jews were imprisoned and tormented until they agreed to pay extra. John's reign saw the greatest financial exploitation of England since the Norman Conquest. In May of 1215, six months after the French whipped his butt, the people of England rebelled and seized London. With the capital held against him, the kings forced to negotiate and obliged to make concessions. The Magna Carta is signed. Then he had it annulled, and then everyone rebelled again, and then John died, and the barons were still rebelling. The end. Next up is William the Conqueror, and he's number six. Before we called him William the Conqueror, he was actually William the Bastard, like something out of a movie. His nobleman father, Robert, came across his tanner mother washing clothes by the river and falls head over heels for her. As a result, the royal heir was not technically royal heir material, but don't let Robert or William hear you say that. Between the two, anyone who ever made fun of William's mother was killed and usually pretty brutally. An example is when the villagers of Alisson hung tanning hides in the trees to mock William's mother's status. William stormed the castle, captured 32 defenders, and had their hands and feet cut off. William, a duke far removed from royal lineage, didn't think too much about England until 1051, when the childless king Edward the Confessor made a truly bizarre decision. He chose William to be his heir. Then, seconds from death, in 1066, he revoked it. William decided, no, I'm getting what I was promised. However, England was in a full-blown crisis of succession for years until William defeated Harold II at the Battles of Hastings and became the new king of England. In wake of his victory, William ordered the harrying of the north. In order for the English population to understand its new state of affairs, he sent his men to the north to kill en masse and pillage stocks. This also made it easier to fulfill his promise of giving the land to his loyal followers. He then imposed new laws, raised taxes, and introduced harsh punishments against those who stepped out of line. The people of England were infuriated by William's new laws, and a series of revolts sprung up north of the country. In response, William and his armies attacked the northern villages, killing everyone in sight as well as the livestock and burning down barns. The lack of livestock led to starvation and disease for what rebels had survived, and the countryside started to reek of corpses. The total death toll, 10,000 people. Up the tower we go for number five. It's Richard III. Richard was never meant to be king, and the malign monarch only landed the job in 1483 because his brother, his brother Edward's children, were deemed too illegitimate for the role. With the support of the Duke of Buckingham, a great campaign promising to improve royal court management, and a stout disapproving of his brother's rampant public adultery, Richard seemed to have potential. But it's kind of hard to praise and look past the two nephews disappearing, however. In August of 1483, the supposed soon-to-be-crowned King Edward and his younger brother, Richard of Shrewberry, were sent to the Tower of London to await Edward's alleged coronation. But his coronation never came, and one day they just disappear. The prince's uncle and would-be king has long since been blamed for their disappearances and probable deaths. He had the most to gain, after all. Richard was also doing everything in his power to prevent the lineage going back to them in the first place, such as planning a marriage between Joanna of Portugal and Manuel, Duke of Beja. When that doesn't work, he tries offering up his niece Elizabeth, who at the time, rumors emerged that Richard was planning to marry himself. The room, This rumor more than possibly drove some to side with Richard's only remaining competition for the throne, Henry Tudor, the same man who defeats and kills Richard at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. On to number four, we have Siva Tapolk the Accursed. Now, damn, that's a heavy name, but it's one well earned. I'll be more than honest, as usual, it's actually quite hard to judge if the medieval nobility of, of Kivan Ru were necessarily good or evil, as we know very little about them, and what we do know is word of mouth stories that survived for centuries before finally being chronicled. So we've all played the kids game telephone, I don't have to tell you how easily word of mouth stories can be converted and contorted. Siva Polk, the son of Vladimir the Grey who baptized Rus to Christianity, certainly had the worst publicity possible documented. He's infamous for the death of his three brothers, Boris Gleb and Svivoslav. Siva Polk's reign was relatively short one, from 1015 to 1019 because brother he hadn't gotten to, Yaroslav the Wise, took action against him. Then Prince of Novgorod Yaroslav defeated his brother 
causing him to flee to Poland where his father-in-law was based. With his help, Sivopolk returned to defeat Yaroslav, causing him to flee back to the Norvogod. It became a back and forth, taking turns driving each other away, and it was only in 1019 that Yaroslav won. Siva died at age 29, traveling back through Poland. Number 3 is Christian the Tyrant. His most notorious act was the Stockholm bloodbath of 1520, when after a three day coronation feast, he beheaded 82 nobles in the Swedish capital after promising them amnesty in return for intel. Up until this point, everything had been going his way. He had reunited the Kalmar Union under his rule, taking control of trade in the Baltic Sea, and married the sister of Charles the Holy Roman Emperor, joining the powerful Habsburg family. But as said by history professor Lars Bittelsgaard, Christian gained a lot of enemies in a very short time at the end of 1520. To quote, the bloodbath was a game changer. Partly it led to a rebellion in Sweden at the time when he didn't have any money left to pay for troops. Partly it was because the Danish nobility began to fear that they would see the same fate and lose their heads. In Denmark, Christian II had carried through a modernization program, limiting the power of nobility and strengthening his power as king. And when has the upper class ever liked having their sense of entitlement towards power tampered with? When Sweden started to break loose from the Kalmar Union, the Danish nobility lost patience, forcing Christian from the throne, driving him into exile, and replacing him with his uncle. Not every ruler is ruling over a kingdom. Number two is John and the White Company. John Hawkwood led the White Company Knights Band that tormented the countryside of France, Italy, and Spain in the 14th century. We've done quite a few videos on this channel that explain how knights are kind of like labor or bodyguards for hire when there isn't some war or inquisition going on. Because medieval aristocrats like to disband their armies the moment they no longer need their services. During those times, the men would band up and ride out. As a result, hardened soldiers often found themselves at loose ends and many miles from their homelands. Since medieval armies fed and supplied themselves by pillaging farms and towns as they went, the mercenaries knew that was efficient, free, and easy for them to accomplish. So they continued in this practice. They roamed the countryside, robbing, violating people, and kidnapping random wealthy hostages for ransom. Of course, they were available for hire, but local landowners were more likely to pay them to simply go away. This is also why chivalry was invented, a code of behaviors and rules to govern these knights to stop their overall rampant and sociopathic behavior. Although Hawkwood, who in retirement would set himself up to be a respectable citizen in Florence, was known for his more insatiable greed than his brutality, and thrived in this time as a freelance knight, he was the leader of a band that carried out the Robert Geneva kill order in Sinia. And when two of his men were fighting over who would get to take a nun, he simply pulled a King Solomon and cut her in half. Problem solved. It's last, but that doesn't mean it's the least. Number one is the Vipers of Milan. Bernardo and Galeazzo Visconti jointly ruled Lombardy in what's modern day Italy. And their joint rule really is a testament for how this family really did do everything together. Everything. They succeeded for throne when they killed their older brother by stabbing him and their uncle Lucinio was killed by his wife. A plan she concocted while in the midst of a group intercourse get together on a riverboat. Good thing for her, one of her multiple male partners was Galezio because she could just pop her head up and tell him the plans right then and there, call that triple tasking. Bernardo, the more ferocious of the two when it came to things that weren't adulterous, such as being in a state of perpetual war with the Pope, who tried to issue a bull of excommunication against him and Bernardo simply responded by forcing the messenger to literally eat it, including the silk cord and the seals of lead that bound it. Bernardo's lusts, by contrast, were unbounded. Has he ever heard the expression about not blaming the messenger. And speaking of Bernardo, watch out Nick Cannon because while he wasn't a riverboat share sash kind of guy, the dozens upon dozens of illegitimate offspring by his various mistresses outnumbered even the 17 children he somehow fathered with his very long suffering wife. Seriously, check out this guy's wiki page, it's the craziest list I have ever seen. Their most demented action, however, was the Quest Amira together. It's a 40 day torment method handbook that they wrote that would be used and distributed for wide, wide public use usage, and it's the origin of plenty horrific methods that we saw used throughout the times. Kicking off our list in 10th place, we have a very weird dish. Thanks to a lexicon of interweb no-no words, I can't say the explicit name, so you'll have to pay very close attention to what I'm spelling out. As far back as history can go, food has been used for sustenance and entertainment. For many of us, we can't be content with the exact same thing every day. We'd grow sick of it or even run out of a certain thing making that unrealistic. Heck, we wouldn't have a cookbook industry if people didn't constantly want to change up their meals. Now back in the dark ages, people had to get creative with what they had, since importing and exporting goods from other countries was nowhere near what it is today. Coming up with a delicacy they called Helmuted, um, um, 
Naughty name for rooster that is also used for a phallus? Work with me here. This was done by stitching a rooster so it seemed to be riding atop a pig with military regalia serving as decorative garnish. I'll stick with herbs for garnishing my meat. Thanks. In ninth place, time to talk about gargoyles. Not to go all hunchback on y'all, but they serve as more than just fascinating architecture. Sadly, they don't sing or talk as far as we know, but there's always hope they just keep it a secret. The term gargoyle comes from the French gargouille, which is the noise of both water and air mixing in the throat. In English, we know this as gargle. Gargoyles were originally designed in 13th century French architecture as a means of disposing of water. Think of them like the precursor to the gutter. Typically, a trough was cut into the back of the gargoyle and rainwater was able to run off the roof and through the gargoyle's mouth. The longer the body of the gargoyle, the further the water was projected. This prevented water from running down the walls and causing damage to the buildings. I'm glad modern plumbing is a lot more progressive since that could have definitely been brutal. However, some gargoyles had another function, warding off evil spirits outside of churches and cathedrals. According to French legend, Saint Romanus saved his country from a dragon named La Gargoyle. After defeating the creature, Saint Romanus burned its body. However, since the dragon had possessed the ability to, you know, breathe fire, its head and neck could not be burned. Therefore, they mounted La Gargoyle's head on the wall of a church and used it to scare off harmful spirits. Most gargoyles are depicted as grotesque creatures, but it is said that like snowflakes, you will never find two that are exactly alike. Feel free to travel the world and compare the ones that are still standing. I'll wait. In eighth place, we have Animal Court. Yep, Fido and Mittens could be dragged in front of a criminal court back in the day if they didn't follow animal law. There are records of at least 85 animal trials that took place during the Dark Ages, and the tales vary from the tragic to the absurd. By far the most serial offenders were pigs, accused and convicted of chewing off body parts and even eating tiny humans. Most were found guilty and sentenced to the uh, rope necklace or being burned at the stake. In 1386, a convicted pig was dressed in a waistcoat, gloves, drawers, and a human mask for its execution. It wasn't just pigs that felt the hand of the law, though. In 1474, a court found a rooster guilty of the unnatural crime of laying an egg. Unwanted rats often found themselves on the receiving end of a strongly worded letter asking them to uh, leave the premises. And curiously enough, there was a trial of dolphins in Marseille in 1596. Okay. However, not all of the trials ended in brutality. One donkey, which found herself the victim of unwanted advances, was proclaimed innocent after a strong recommendation from a convent's prior, declaring her to be a virtuous and well-behaved animal. Uh, if anyone wants to hold court for modern dogs that chew up furniture, be my guest. Not much surprises me anymore. In seventh place, we have the origin of nursery rhymes. I thought this one was common knowledge, but after talking with colleagues and friends, enough people didn't know about just how dark nursery rhymes can be, so ergo, this entry. Alrighty, hands up, who has sung Ring Around the Rosie? If you forget, we shall sing it together. Trust me, I've got this thing memorized thanks to my work in children's entertainment, so here goes. Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Now let's break this down, shall we? <laughs> yeah, I know, I should be tried for my puns. A ring around a rosy is a rash, which is the sign of a plague. A pocket full of posies is to ward off the smell, and ashes are from burning bodies. Sure, children's fun. I've sang a version that continued to add on to the lyrics, going, skipping and a singing, having lots of fun, laughing, running underneath the sun. And while I commend the attempt to try and make it more cheerful, personally it just felt a lot more demented. Another dark one is the classic London Bridge is Falling Down. No, no, don't worry, I'm not gonna sing again. I know, it's bad. It's a traditional English nursery rhyme and singing game about the dilapidation of London Bridge and attempts to repair it back in the Dark Ages. It dates back to bridge-related rhymes and games of that time. A well-known hypothesis is that the song refers to the burying, perhaps alive, of bodies in the foundations of the bridge. This theory was based on the idea that a bridge would collapse unless the body of a human sacrifice was buried in its foundations and that the watchman is actually the human sacrifice who will then watch over the bridge. Oh, that sounds too far-fetched? Bodies were found beneath London Bridge in 2007 while building work was being carried out for the London Dungeons tourist attraction. 
I rest my case. In sixth place, we have an uncommon plague. I know, I know, no one wants to hear about a plague ever again after recent history, but I promise this one isn't your typical version. The Dancing Plague of 1518, or the Dance Epidemic of 1518, was a case of dancing mania that occurred in what is now known as France from July until September of that year. The outbreak began when a woman by the name of Fro Tocho Fefa began to dance fervently in a street for a week straight. Soon, three dozen others joined in on the dancing chaos, with the plague claiming 400 victims by August. By early September, the outbreak began to subside, as the dancers were sent to a mountain shrine to pray for absolution. Guess we found where Footloose took inspiration. It is unsure just how many, but a small number of victims did pass from this epidemic, which is wild. Historical documents, including physicians' notes, cathedral sermons, local and religious chronicles, and even notes issued by the city council, are clear that the victims danced, but it is not known why. There are many theories behind the phenomenon, the most popular being stress-induced mass hysteria. Other theories include ergot, which I'll touch on in just a moment, and religious explanations. It would be interesting to see if this ever pops up again in modern times. Hey, look, sometimes a gal just wants a flash dance moment without judgment, okay? Okay, fine, maybe me. In fifth place, we've got bad bread. In today's modern age, if bread starts looking funky, we tend to just, you know, eat around it or toss it, but people didn't always have that awareness. Ergot is a fungus blight that forms hallucinogenic drugs in bread. Its victims can appear bewitched when they're actually just higher than a kite. It thrives in a cold winter followed by a wet spring. The victims of this might suffer from paranoia and hallucinations, twitches and spasms, cardiovascular trouble, and uh, stillborn births. Now this also seriously weakens the immune system. Human poisoning due to the consumption of rye bread made from ergot infected grain was common in Europe in the Dark Ages. The first mention of a plague of gangrenous ergotism in Europe comes from Germany in 857. And following this, France and Scandinavia experienced similar outbreaks. England is noticeably absent from the historical regions affected by this, as its main source of food was wheat, which is resistant to the fungi. Hmm. In 944, a massive outbreak of ergotism caused 40,000 deaths in the regions of Aquitaine, Limousin, Perigold, and Angoumois in France. Ergotism is actually believed to have played a large role in witch hunts, since the symptoms of this poisoning and the signs of bewitchment are almost identical. Witch hunts hardly occurred where people didn't eat rye. Just saying. In fourth place, we have the younglings of Woolpit. Mm hmm. Those no no words have thwarted my vocabulary again. How'd you guess? The legend of the green younglings has been told time and time again, and I'm surprised today's research was the first I've learned about them. A brother and sister duo were found near. Take a guess. Yep, the village of Woolpit in the 12th century. Dang, y'all are good at these guessing games. <laughs> They spoke in an unknown language and looked relatively normal, minus the green color of their skin. After being rescued, they refused to consume anything for several days until presented with raw broad beans, and eventually learned to eat other foods. Shortly after being baptized, the brother passed away. Hmm, okay, slightly suspicious, but the gal adjusted to her new life, and was considered very wanton and impudent. Uh, simply put, in modern English, she had a mind of her own and refused to be docile. A girl. After she learned to speak English, the girl explained that she and her brother had come from a land where the sun never shined, everything was green, and the light was like twilight. I'm guessing they were living in some sort of forested environment, but maybe they were aliens? Hey look, with all the research I do on alien life, you cannot blame a gal for jumping to that conclusion. In third place, we have divorce by combat. Yep, people could get divorced, but it was a heck of a process. Divorce by combat appears to have been a form of trial by combat which was when accusations were dealt with between two parties where there were no witnesses or a confession. Whoever won the duel was deemed to be right. The rules for divorce by combat as we know it come from Hans Tullhofer's Fechtbuch, which was written in 1467 and are as follows. The man would be placed in a waist height one meter deep hole with one hand tied behind his back while the woman was allowed to move freely. Both parties wore practical clothes, which was described as a one piece bodysuit with stirrup legs. The woman was armed with three rocks, each wrapped in a length of cloth to form a kind of swinging club. The man was given three normal clubs that matched the length of the woman's cloth to ensure that their ranges were equal. The man was not allowed to leave that hole, by the way. To further limit him, if he touched the edge of his hole with either his hand or his arm, he had to surrender one of his clubs. If the woman attacked him while he was surrendering his club, she in turn forfeited one of her rocks. 
Yes, the rules place the man at a clear disadvantage, but it's important to remember that it is unlikely that the woman had any kind of combat training. Furthermore, in any kind of physical contest, it is likely that the male would have an advantage in size and strength. For that time period. Not modern day. I watched WWE. Women can beat up men. So the handicaps placed upon the man were to try and make the fight as fair as possible. That's honestly pretty dang impressive for the time period. The conditions for victory are unclear. Some historians believed it was unlikely that fights were to the death, instead it was probably down to the judges to decide when one of the fighters had been incapacitated. Since both parties were hitting each other with big blunt objects, it seems likely that many trials ended with one party being knocked unconscious. Thankfully divorces are mostly, you know, a lot less lethal today. Look, I said mostly. In second place, we have methods of obtaining information. Nowadays, if one is in court and receives a sentence of any kind, it's usually, you know, being detained to a prison or institution, charged a financial amount, or community service. But courts weren't always humane. Heck, this could probably make like a decent top 10 on its own, but I'll try to condense it today. As the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for 1139 put it, courts hang them by their thumbs, or by the head, and hung fires on their feet. They put knotted strings about their heads and writhed them so that it went to the brain. Sometimes they put in a chest that was short and narrow and shallow, and put sharp stones therein, and pressed the man therein. I neither can nor may tell all the wounds or all the tortures which they inflicted on the wretched men in this land. Pressure devices from that time period can be classified in many ways, but I've managed to narrow it down somewhat. If they leave a mark or not, if they draw bodily fluid or not, physical versus psychological anguish, and if it was used to extract information or as an additional punishment to prolong death. During my research, I read up on over 50 different versions of heinous punishment, half of which include words I definitely can't say, and others that would send me retching if I tried to describe them here. Uh, you, you want me to try? Oh, okay. It's on y'all's conscience, so if anything happens to me. A cheap and popular way to end someone slowly was by forcing a rat through a victim's body as a way to escape a cage that they had been put in. Since y'all need details so much, the rat was caged, not the human. Unless stopped almost immediately, this torture always resulted in eventual death. Once again, I could go on for hours if y'all really want me to, but I'm suddenly a little queasy and I'd like to keep my food in my stomach if you don't mind. In first place, we have people munching in ancient Egypt and Europe. Yeah, remember that list of no-no words? Yeah, here we go again. The question in old society was not should one consume human flesh, but how and what kind of flesh did you want to consume? Grave robbers were making bank, but sadly, no one was selling Zydrate in a little glass vial. The answer at first was Egyptian mummy, which was crumbled up to stop internal red fluid release. Skull was one common ingredient taken in powdered form to cure head ailments. One popular drink to cure apoplexy mixed powdered human skull and chocolate, while the most coveted remedy mixed skull with alcohol. Even the toupee of moss that grew over a buried skull, called usnea, became a prized additive, its powder believed to cure nosebleeds and possibly epilepsy. Human fat was used to treat the outside of the body, red human fluid was procured as fresh as possible while it was still thought to contain the vitality of the body. One physician even recommended drinking it fresh from a living donor. Uh, no, he was not accused of being a vampire. It's shocking, I know. The poor, who couldn't always afford the processed compounds sold in apothecaries, could gain the benefits by standing at executions, paying a small amount for a cup of the still warm life source of the condemned. Thanks. Rome really had existed as nothing but a name by the time the empire falls on September 4th of 476, having been falling inwards on itself for just short of a century at that point. So started the periods between the 5th and the 15th centuries known as the Middle Ages. This time can be split into three main sections, the Early Middle Ages, aka the Dark Ages, High Middle Ages, and Late Middle Ages. One of the most famous events from the entirety of the Middle Era was truly kicking some ass in the Dark Ages, and it was the Black Death, something that nobody gets anymore with with exception for a cool 20,000 some odd people between 2000 and 2009, and 56 people in the United States in the last few years. But if we pretend that we don't know that, and if we can avoid chipmunks like the effing plague carrying hairbringers of death they are, then we most likely don't have to worry. But travel back in time, say to the 800s or even 1340s Europe, and your chances of surviving are somewhere between 7 and 10 and 2 and 5. Black Death killed as much as 
60% of the entire population of Europe. So when you're at work looking around but with those blank dead fish eyes bored, cross off every third person you see in a pattern of five and try to figure out how many of them are gone and who you'd manage without. Probably now being in a position to go, hey boss, looks like you need new middle management team and ain't since nobody left, hooray, promotion. That's exactly what happened in the middle ages too, after half the world died, kind of changed the balance of power. Suddenly peasants could ask for pay raises and improvements in working conditions and life got a little better for them. This was further developed by the evolution of feudalism. And as a result, the first banks and widespread money supply appeared for the first time in Europe. RIP freedom, hello capitalism. And speaking of the workforce, how about their dirty jobs? Knight, tosher, rat catcher, oh my, there's no shortage of terrible jobs in the dark ages. So let's cover a few. So a leech collector was a woman's role. She was often living in the countryside near marshes and bogs, just generally dirty open water spots where she could strip her legs bare, grab a bucket and wade into the mud, waiting for leeches to sucker themselves on. At that point she could scrape the buggers off, bucket them and then sell them in town to physicians, the wealthy people, beauty stores, whatever. Enjoy the scabs and infectious diseases. The groom of the stool was a position for the royal household who was in charge of cleaning the king's badunkadunk, making sure it was clean and dry post his kingly, well, dumps. Tanning leather seems like it would just be hard. Don't worry, on top of stripping animal skin of its fur, soaking it and consequently yourself in lots of lime and salt, it also involved animal feces. See, you'd hire this other guy who somehow had a worse job than you, he's called a peer collector. He'd collect you dog poop, you'd grab it with your bare hands and mush it into leather to treat it. And don't get started on lime burners or treadmill operators, which was essentially a 50-50 death sentence job. And usually whatever job you ended up with was one for life, because chances are you stay in one place. Many people dream of traveling, my generation especially is one that's opting out of children in order to do so. This isn't new and the human desire to travel and learn is something inherent, coming with curiosity and the need to discover. But this wasn't one of those times. Written records show that a sizable proportion of people not only didn't travel to other countries, they never even left their region or the village they were born in. Even if you did manage to travel, it wasn't planes and annoying but passable airport waits. The average traveler would often sleep out in the open air, inns or other forms of accommodation were few and far between and usually too expensive for the typical person to afford. So aside from the super fun chance of freezing to death overnight, travelers in the middle ages also had to worry about being robbed or attacked on the road. Many people therefore chose to travel in groups, but even then you weren't entirely safe, your homies could turn on you at any second. Consider also that roads and pathways were rough and this was a ridiculous era where even spraining an ankle could prove to be fatal. Then there's finally bridges, which are quite rare, especially outside of big cities, so you might have to cross rivers manually and while they could memorize and recite Latin every day, these dummies couldn't swim. Drowning was all too commonplace, even the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I died while attempting to cross a river. So if you're gonna live in one region, one city, and one house your whole life, naturally it would be a dingy shack because peasants' homes were small, often just made up of one room. They were constructed of wattle and daub, a type of method of constructing walls, in which vertical wooden stakes, or wattles, are woven with horizontal twigs and branches, and then daubed with clay or mud. Then they'd have a thatched roof to boot, and if they're well constructed, these bad boys could be waterproof and stand for a decent amount of time. But they required upkeep, and not everyone can afford that, especially seeing as it's essentially paper mache twigs and mud, you really had to stay on top of this. Inside of a hut, a third of the air Area was penned off for animals which lived inside with the family. I know people that complain about the smell of a cat litter box. My guy, you could have had a whole donkey living next to the kitchen sink. Chickens, cows, pigs. Then to really complement the mildew smell of rotting roof and the stink of sweat and feces covered animals, a fire burned in the hearth in the center of the hut so that the air was permanently eye-waterily smoky. Furniture was maybe a couple stools, a trunk and bedding, and a few cooking pots. Beds were a thing, but they weren't very great. And don't forget a couple of dirty chamber pots kicking around the room. We may have discovered a new homing style, you guys. We could call it medieval open conceptualism with minimalism aesthetic. And when it's time to get your kid out of the house, you hook them up with an apprenticeship. The freaky Greekies weren't the only ones tossing their kids at other adults saying, here, take this and raise it. However, unlike the Greek apprenticeship, which came with some strings attached, as explained in the recent top 10 reasons why living in ancient Greece was impossible video, the dark age apprenticeship was truly and solely about work. But nobody said it was 
is good or fair work. From the midpoint of the Middle Ages onward, master craftsmen were permitted to employ youngsters for free so long as they provided them with food, lodging, and formal training in their specific craft, which would undoubtedly elevate their status in this society. But getting through an apprenticeship was hard as hell. First, nobody said the food had to be quality, so rations often sucked and apprentices could effectively starve. But then there was the fact you could just get beat up by your master at any time, because it was literally expected of them to do that. Why? Because apprenticeships were ways of parents to get crappy, troublesome teens out of the house and learn some discipline in society. To add insult to injury, apprentices were stuck between childhood and adulthood by being teens. Because on one hand, a teen in medieval times would have been treated as an adult. On the other hand, privileges of adulthood, like the right to inherit money or ownership of land, didn't come into play until around age 21. So you're expected to be an adult, treated like a kid. Small wonder then that the tales of apprentices misbehaving badly are a staple of written accounts from the Middle Ages. Rather than dedicating themselves to their professional development, apprentices would often be found in pubs and brothels. Normal middle aged teen activity. And having a crappy kid sucks even more so back then than now because of the baby gamble. Choosing, if a woman got to choose, to have a baby was a hell of a decision in the dark ages. Plagues, famines, messed up weather, just not the environment for it. Let alone women being regarded as morally weak and they weren't allowed to do things that modern women take for granted, like getting a job, deciding who to marry, having opinions, wearing pants. Your only two options were to become a nun or marriage. No work, no single living in the country, you get two options. And even if you weren't the most devoutedly religious, none was safer, if not a better option. Childbirth and pregnancies would kill one out of every three women in the dark ages. Compare that to today's maternity morality rate as one out of every 0.028% of women. The fact that the female population now is significantly more equal in numbers to men in comparison, I think the choice is spectacularly easy. According to the Raven Report, childbirth in the Middle Ages and the Tudor period were so dangerous, royal women were encouraged to write out their last will and testament well in advance to giving birth. Just imagine adding that to the baby to-do list under decorate nursery and sew onesies. But on the flip side, some men weren't exactly capable of popping out babies, thus the impotence trials. Modern time has counseling, understanding doctors, and little blue pills. All sorts of resources to help men with that issue. But the Middle Ages? Whew, don't expect any real sympathy, not from wives or the whole community. Conjugal duties are taken hella seriously, partially because everyone was frisky and they're locked into having just one person for the rest of their life. And it wasn't just men who had the right to ask their partners to perform. Wives could also demand intimacy and failure to provide, well, buddy, you're getting served. And many recorded cases of women being granted divorce due to their husband's infancy exist to prove it. And they were carried out in public. Whole Judge Judy style throwdowns to called impacy trials where accused man was expected to um, perform in front of the jury. To be granted a divorce, the woman had to prove her man was unable to perform, which wouldn't be shocking when you have an entire village watching with bated breath, even if it wasn't an issue before. Don't worry, a dude could save himself the shame of an annulment by calling on special witnesses such as working girls or other women from the past who could attest his manly prowess. Any medieval lady capable of putting her husband through such a humiliating ritual was almost always from a wealthy family. Lawyers and expert physicians didn't come cheap, but at the end of the day, men were literally able to cut our faces off in public or throw us in a fire alive for not baking bread right, so guys, I don't really think you can complain about this too much. Laws like this are one of the many stupid details that could have you randomly imprisoned. Another one, stingy stripes. Living in the dark ages is impossible for a lot of reasons, but having to keep track of hundreds of stingy laws to ensure you don't get locked up over a mistake truly was one of the hardest factors. What was the wrong way to pray? The wrong hair? A mole in the wrong spot? A color only the king can wear? Or how the simple act of wearing stripes could lead to your imprisonment or even death? Why? Because for some reason, striped clothing were seen as a garment of the devil. Thus, anyone caught wearing them would at best get an evil eye from people in the street or at worst, get a hemp necktie. From the year 1250 onwards, the only people who were caught wearing stripes were the lowest of the low in society. Working girls, handicapped, the ill, the orphaned. They would don striped outfits, highlighting their status as outsiders. In 1295, Pope Boniface issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. In the year 1310, in the French town of Rouen, for example, a local cobbler was condemned to death simply because he'd been caught wearing striped clothes. Crazily, even animals weren't exempt. Records show that zebras were called beasts of the devil, even though people in Europe had only ever heard reports of them and hadn't even seen one with their own eyes. You can see how these guys led to colonization, right? Ridiculous. With the dawn of the Enlightenment in Europe, the hatred of stripes eased and eventually disappeared, and many look on the phenomenon with confusion, and understandably so. Time for the Shrek references. It's 
ogres and pitchforks. More specifically, just the pitchforks and less specifically, really just the farm tools in general. You guys know in the movies like Shrek when the villagers all come carrying pitchforks and farm tools and of all things, like why that and not swords? First of all, swords are heavy and who has that kicking around? Seriously. Secondly, noblemen could require all male peasants over the age of 18 to report for military service. Didn't matter if it was a justified war against a viable external threat or just a petty fight against a local rival. If you are called up for duty, you had to report. According to histories of the time, around 1 in 5 peasant men would be in a military service. Food and clean water were in short supply and disease was rife. Some historians reckon two thirds of all conscripted men who died were killed by unsanitary conditions of their own camps over any enemy action. But peasants were required to bring their own weapons. Moreover, they would rarely receive anything more than rudimentary training so they're sent to war unprepared and ill-equipped. Thus the thought process, well if this tool works on my farm, for this, it'll work for that. So uh, what really sucked about military service in medieval times is how little was in for it for you. These days joining the military can be a way of learning a trade or generally improving your lot in life. Not so back then. Feudal lords were fearful of their peasants getting too powerful. So you're once a farmer, you're staying one. If a peasant soldier got too skillful on the field of battle, there were several cases of them ending up mysteriously dead. It's like getting a journalist of the year award from the CIA. And finally, it wasn't just living that was impossible, but death sucked too. Alright, so evidently, whether from this video, others, or general universal knowledge, Dark Ages was pretty grim reality to live in. It's short, dirty, desolate, and brutal. But when it wasn't short, it was somehow worse. See, anyone over the age of 50, which was a crazy age achievement at the time, was deemed elderly. Unlike other cultures existing at the time, elderly in Europe are not even close to revered or respected. You didn't get to retire, having to pay your own way and continuing to work until physically you simply couldn't. Then, yeah, after that, you're really just a burden. Your own kids are side eyeing you, and everyone's asking you why haven't you haven't died yet? What's the big hold up here, guys? For many, death was the only real chance to escape from everyday hardships or working the fields and trying to get enough money and food to survive. And when that finally happens, and you pass through and rejoin the energies of our Earth, you will finally find your peace. Yeah, no, psych. That still didn't happen. According to some research in Europe during the Middle Ages, mass of 40% of graves were disturbed. Now, this wasn't like grave robbing during the enlightenment. There were no university medical schools paying good money for fresh corpses to study. Rather, most cases of grave disturbances were run-of-the-mill theft. Often people would be buried with a small selection of their possessions, perhaps a favorite cup, a locket, a stuffed animal toy, or other such trinkets. In tough times, even some dead person's mystery grave junk might be enough to tempt a broke thief to dig someone up. However, this wasn't always the case. There's some even weirder crap, too. Archaeologists in England have found evidence to suggest that in dozens upon dozens of quote grave robbing cases, rather than looking for objects, those responsible bound and gagged the dead bodies and then left them like that. It seems like they're fearful of restless souls, or perhaps of the undead rising again. Who knows, they had a lot of problems back then. Number 10. Nightman. Oh, the name Nightman sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? If you're part of the Nightman, you might be a guild that washes over the dark, you know, protecting people like a superhero team, fighters of the day man, master of karate and all that. Well, if only life were that cool. No, you definitely would not want to be a Nightman. A Nightman was a very polite name for a job that boiled down to guy who cleaned human feces out of the cesspit. Yeah. You ever use a septic tank and thought, wow, this is prehistoric technology? Well, imagine a medieval precursor to a septic tank, if you will, and you've got yourself a cesspit. Easily one of the crappiest jobs in human history. Now the name makes it sound like you'd only be doing this for a few hours, right? Were it so easy, humble nightman. Nightmen would dig for weeks at a time gathering their goods, as they were usually paid by weight, not hours. Consider that, and then consider that any of the lovely amenities you and I have to avoid bacteria, masks, sanitizers, these guys had never even heard of and were shoveling stacks of crap by the literal ton with their hands and faces uncovered, huffing in unimaginable fumes. I imagine that's the kind of work that changes a man on the inside forever. Number 9. Fuller Perhaps one step down from the humble work of shoveling refuse all day like a nightman is the honest life of a fuller. You see, a fuller's job was to remove the oils from cloth woven from sheepskin and wool. Wool, naturally waterproof thanks to the oils on the sheep's skin, but the underside is very coarse and easily frayed and therefore needed to be dealt with before it can be made into things. 
Nowadays, we would just use an alkaline solution, call it a day. However, back then, chemistry sets weren't really like available, so you'd have to make do with what you had, right? And what better source of natural alkaline than in pee? Specifically old pee, nice and stale. We're looking for that burnt sienna orange. So the fuller takes the woven wool and cloth, soaks it in a nice giant tub full of old pee, and then stomps on it like you're crushing grapes for wine, except it's not at all like you're crushing grapes for wine because you're stomping on wool full of old pee. It was fairly common as well for fullers to, uh, to source their own alkaline solution, for lack of a better word. There was no royal distributor of old pee. You couldn't stroll up to the pee man. So they'd have to scrounge and collect it themselves. And if that meant heading to public toilets and private homes, knocking on the front door with their hands held open for a big handout, you know, every drop counts. I can't believe I'm getting paid to say this. Number eight, a whipping boy. Have you ever heard the expression whipping boy to be someone's whipping boy? I know I've certainly heard it a lot, but the history of it is actually pretty fascinating. It was a real position. And basically your whole job as whipping boy was to take the licks for a misbehaving royal. When you have an up and coming noble figure, a prince, a duke, this sort of thing, when they're being taught by their tutors, it would be an unimaginable offense to strike the royal for misbehaving as their status was leagues above of the tutors. But you can't have someone misbehaving without any retribution at all, right? A little negative motivation to push you to work harder and learn harder. That is where a whipping boy comes in. The whipping boy, sometimes a friend of the prince being taught, would be struck in front of the prince in order to motivate him to not commit the same transgressions. It seems a bit like a bit of a flawed system because from what I know of medieval European history, it's that kings and princes were rarely remembered for their generosity and compassion for their employees. Now bizarrely, whipping boy was actually seen as a fairly desirable position since it meant you had like an in with the king. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure many young princes saw the guy who was being beaten over the head with a broom and thought this man is my equal and my confidant and a trusted ally. Number Number seven, groom of the stool. Ah, now this is a fancy sounding job title, groom of the stool. Got a bit of an air of quality to it. In truth, it actually was a bit of a respected lofty position. You had a very close hand to the royal throne. You had a very close hand to the throne. You had your hand pretty much behind the king's bottom at all times. The groom of the stool, to put it gently, was the royal wiper. You see, there's no one bigger or more important than the king, right? The king is like a god amongst common men, and no god should have to debase themselves to something as absolutely humiliating, as dehumanizing as using the bathroom by yourself. So that's where the groom of the stool triumphantly strides in, washcloth in hand. You were kept on retainer whenever the king felt nature's call. You were instructed to fetch the chair and take care of business. And the wipe? That's all you, that's all groom of the stool, baby. That's your moment to shine. And you know, a lot of grooms really got creative with this. They could show off their style, technique, wrist control. There's a lot of artistry to it that I think people realized. The groom of the king did more than just fetching and wiping too. As the man most connected with royal stool, the groom also shared the responsibility of monitoring what was going on down there for any changes in the king's health. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, but much heavier is the hand that wipes the bottom. Number six, cat gut. Okay, in contrast to the last one that had a nice name, this one has a disgusting name, cat gut. Way back when in yesteryear, they didn't have the same tools available to us now when crafting musical instruments, so they had to get creative. If you wanted to hear something beautiful on violin, you couldn't just head on down to Long and McQuaid and pick up a pack of strings. You'd need a guy willing to get his hands wrist deep in some cat gut. Now, confusingly, no actual cats were involved, but plenty of sheep were. Violin strings were made of sheep's guts and they would make the strings by twisting strands of sheep's intestines and innards together. Lovely. They'd have to be careful while butchering the animals to make sure they didn't accidentally harm any of the goods. This process would take hours out of time from the butchering, the careful removal of the organs, and then they needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution to be clean since they were inside a sheep, and then stared at for a few hours to make sure nothing was going wrong, and then the drying process could begin. They say there is nothing more exciting than watching sheep guts dry. And then you can get your twist on, make them into violin. 
absolutely disgusting, but when you hear the sweet strings of Ave Maria, and you hear how finely tuned those sheep intestines are, you know it's all worth it. Number five, Sin Eater. This is one of the most metal job titles around. I'm pretty sure the Sin Eater was a boss in Elden Ring, wasn't he? He's in Caelid somewhere. This is definitely one of the more unholy jobs in this list. Not as disgusting as gut stringing or crap slinging, but pretty horrid in its own right. Sin Eaters ate sins, and the best way to eat a metaphorical concept of wrongdoing was to eat bread off the corpse of someone who died recently. The idea being that the sins of the man would be transferred onto the bread? I don't know. Anyway, they eat the sins, and the deceased gets to go off to heaven without worrying about their history, could go on peacefully, and the sin eaters make some coin. They were willing to take a risk dooming their mortal soul for a bit of coin. Man's gotta eat. I wonder though, is it worth it? Like what if you eat too many sins and you don't have any room for dessert? Do sins have an added flavor? I imagine it's got like just a little kick, like a sriracha, like it's a little hot on your tongue. Number four, lime burner. Now a lime burner doesn't sound so bad at first. Lime mortar is a common building material, being traced back to the first century, but it's not particularly easy to work with. Bear with me while I try to explain the technicals, I'm not as smart as a first century engineer, you see. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone, taking the stone and cooking it in a kiln at around a cool 800 degrees. It's not too bad, right? Well that carbon monoxide has got to go somewhere, mostly in the air. All that carbon monoxide and dust chalk would just float around in the air where you'd be taking big heavy deep breaths in and I'm not sure how much you know about carbon monoxide but it's consistently the number one spot on Rolling Stones magazine list of top 100 substances to not breathe in. On top of this, did you know that superheated lime mortar is violently volatile against water? Meaning that if you were to sue, you know, sweat in a building that was 800 degrees at any given time, it would have disastrous consequences. Be careful. Number three, rat catcher. It doesn't sound fancy, but it's exactly what it says in the tin. You catch rats. You gotta wonder why you wouldn't just outsource this to the cat community. They're very good at this sort of thing. Rats, cute as I find them, at the time were filled to bursting with plague, disease, all kinds of grossness. Castle stock rooms were filled with grain, vegetables, and herbs, and if you're a rat, those are the things that make life worthwhile. Rats were a problem for nobility, but an even bigger issue for common folk and peasants, because if these little rats ate up what little grain you had, you would go destitute fast. But oh, come on, who can say no to their little posies and their little eyesies? I'm biased, I love rats. I would be a rat catcher if I could. Some rat catchers allegedly were reported to have raised their own supply of rats in order to squeak a few extra dollars out of the town. That's hilarious, by the way, love that scheme. Now traditionally, their methods would involve things like leaving out traps or poisoned herbs. That wasn't always enough though, so rat catchers would also invoke the old methods, namely, magic, and try to entice rats away with spells. This often didn't work terribly well since rats are naturally resistant to magic, like everybody knows this. Number two, plague bearer. The plague ravaged London and Europe, leaving behind a wake of bodies and a stack of corpses as high as your medieval eyes could see. So somebody had to deal with all of that, right? A street sweeper of sorts was needed? You remember in Monty Python and the Holy Grail when Eric Idle is going around ringing his little bell telling everyone to come bring out their dead? Hilarious, right? Well, it's partly based on reality because this is more or less what a plague bearer really was. The parish would hire out plague bearers who would then tour the streets of the village or town or whatever, wagon in hand, collecting the bodies of the ailing and dead to go dump in a mass graveyard shortly after. Tons of fun! They would spend their nights surrounded by dead bodies and their days in the church with the same dead bodies because according to the church's law, they were required to live there to prevent spreading what they were dealing with to anyone else. This might be history's first case of social distancing. And finally, at number one of the jobs you don't want is executioner. We've all heard of this one, and we're probably conjuring up a pretty vivid image of a burly shirtless monster in a black hood with a big ol' axe or something, wielded by someone who can't get enough of their day job and love their passion of separating necks from heads. In actuality, medieval people weren't that psychotic, and most executioners didn't join the practice out of a love of the game, but were usually coerced into it. Some were butchers who were called to the job, some were criminals who could do the job in exchange for a reduced sentence, but most commonly, it was a family business. If your dad was the town executioner, it was very likely you would be next in line to wear the hood. Now the downsides to this job seem immediately obvious, unless you're super into bloodshed and death, it's Probably not the cheeriest job. Seems like the kind of thing you, you take home with you, you know? Kind of hard to lay loose and relax after that. But you know what's worse than the weight of taking another man's life? 
social isolation. Executioners were not particularly well liked, looked down upon as outcasts, sometimes even forced to live outside of town. Ah, oh, well, you know what, executioner? It could be worse. You could be the groom of the stool, you could be a nightman. So, count your blessings. Number 10, beauty sleep. When you go to bed at night, ideally, you want eight hours. Me, personally, I'm lucky if I get like six. I don't know, I'm like a child. I'm restless at night, I'm kicking around, I'm making weird noises, it's insane, it's problematic. Maybe I should see someone. If this were medieval times, however, I'd be set. See, back in the dark ages, it was common to have two four hour naps at night rather than one swift eight hour slumber. See, many believe this was to tend to a fire or hopefully not a fire. You know, gotta wake up, make sure things aren't gone. It's medieval times, it was rough. You wake up, throw a log on, yawn, and then hop back into your pile of hay. I don't know, whatever they had back then. Good times. This system of waking up after four hours, it sounds like an unhealthy inconvenience, but in reality, historical accounts suggest that people in the dark ages generally Generally slept for longer periods of time, despite their sleep being interrupted by periods of wakefulness. They slept longer due to the fact that, you know, light bulbs didn't exist yet, so lava lamps weren't a thing, neither were alarm clocks. So people would often go to bed shortly after sunset and wake up with the sunrise, so that's a good rest. That's a good medieval rest. That's like 12 hours. Number nine, the Norse disappearance. I just watched the Norsemen. I'm gonna start barking at people now when I'm on the subway, just to, you know, get my old roots back, my old Norse roots. There are several theories regarding the disappearance of the Norse from Greenland during the Dark Ages, right? Where did they go? Where does a Norse Viking go? That's a little concerning. Where'd that guy go with the beard and the hatchet? That's a little important. One theory suggests that climate change played a significant role. The Little Ice Age, which began around the 14th century, that led to a decrease in temperature and a shorter growing season. Of course, making it difficult for the Norse to farm and raise livestock and, you know, have that big mighty beard and eat good. This could have resulted in a decline in food production leading to famine and ultimately the collapse of Norse settlement. Another theory suggests that the North were on the North, the Norse, the North of the North. Another theory suggests that the Norse were unable to adapt to the harsh conditions of Greenland. The Norse were used to living in more temperate climates and the extreme conditions of Greenland could have been too difficult for them to endure. They're a little too hot for comfort. Finally, there's a theory that the Norse were driven out by the Inuit who had been migrating into Greenland around the same time as the North. So a little bit of a beef happened there, a little West Side Story with Vikings, if I may. The Inuit were skilled hunters and fishers, and their presence could have put pressure on the North Settlement, ergo war. But it's likely that the combination of these factors contributed to the disappearance of the North altogether. So exact reason, that's uh, still a mystery. I vote the Inuit though. There's probably some beef. There's probably some settlement beef. Number eight, green children of Woolpit. Now this one, this is a medieval story that tells the tale of two children who randomly appeared in the village of Woolpit in England, but they showed up with green skin and they spoke an unknown language. So aliens confirmed, for sure aliens. I wouldn't even open that door. The children were taken in by a nice local landowner and although they were initially very distressed and refused to eat any human foods, they eventually adapted to their new surroundings. Again, green children didn't speak English, aliens. Reminder. The boy eventually learned to speak English over time and he explained that he and his sister came from a land where the sun does not shine and everything was green. Yeah, it's like Avatar 3 going on. Something's going on out there. Sometimes the grass is greener on the other side, but sometimes the people are also green. That's fun. That's a fun little bit. Bunch of incredible hooks in a place where there's no sun. Sounds nice and warm and welcoming. Lovely. Let's find out more. The origins of the story, of course, remain a mystery with various interpretations ranging from folklore to my personal favorite, extraterrestrial encounters. Love aliens. Love that. Grew up watching signs. You tell me in the comments. Did this happen? Are these aliens? Were these just random children? Children? This is all bullshit. Who knows? Number seven, Shroud of Turin. The origins of the Shroud of Turin, a piece of cloth that bears the image of a um, one Jesus Christ, a crucified man, shrouded in mystery, it seems. According to tradition, the shroud was used to wrap the body of, again, one Jesus Christ after his crucifixion, and many Christians believe this right here to be the burial cloth of Christ. I pointed like I actually have it here. I don't have it here. I wish I did. That would be great. We get a lot of likes, but no, it's over there. However, its authenticity is the subject of ongoing debate, of course, because... I mean, who really knows? The shroud first appeared in historical records in the 14th century, and it's been housed in Turin, Italy, since the late 16th century. Again, that's a pretty mighty piece of cloth right there. Next national treasure, Nicolas Cage has to grab that and put it in his pocket like a cowboy. Number six, John Cabot's fate. John Cabot, he was an Italian explorer who sailed under the English flag, and he's known for his voyages to North America in the late 15th century. His final voyage in 1497, this was intended to establish English trade and settlements in the New World. 
But Cabot, he set out with a small fleet of ships from Bristol, England, and he sailed along the eastern coast of North America. However, something happened. He encountered difficulties, I guess one could say, including rough weather and a mutiny among his crew, which is much worse than a storm, I would say. And his fate remains unknown to this day. That rhymed, Dr. Seuss, love it. Some historians believe that Cabot may have perished at sea, while others speculate that he may have made it back to England and then died there. So how did he go? Was he eaten? Who knows? Who really knows? Number five, the plague. Yes, we just lived through one of these. That's in the, isn't that neat? Can't wait to tell my kids about that one. Plagues are everywhere throughout history. Some are short, some are impossibly incredibly long. The bubonic plague arrived to medieval England in 1348. Now the death toll here, it was devastating. I mean, we put up some crazy numbers in the last few years, don't get me wrong, but in the dark ages, the bubonic plague took out almost half of England's population. That's insane. They didn't even have Uber back then. You're like, how? How did that happen? Back then, the plague was a bacterium now known as Yersinia pestis. Symptoms were jarring, to say the least. There were lumps in the armpits and or, um, you know, groin area. Not fun. Black spots would appear all over your body. It was uncomfortable. And it was noticeable, definitely to say the least, that you were plagued out. Almost all that were infected died within three days. More often than not, without a fever. Just randomly. Boom. Done. The drop in the population resulted in a widespread of wealth. That's, uh, I guess, a bright side. Not really. Workers were demanding higher wages. Farmers were demanding lower rents. And the poor got expendable income. Sounds a little familiar, dare I say. Number four. Greek fire. This one's absolutely crazy. Greek fire was a weapon used in medieval times. It was particularly used by the Byzantine Empire and it was known for its ability to burn even when submerged in water. Yeah, almost like magic, some would say. Some scary hot magic. The composition of Greek fire was a closely guarded secret, but it was known to be a highly flammable liquid that could be projected from tubes onto enemy ships or soldiers. So yeah, they would just blast liquid lava at you. And then they're like, yeah, war's done. Just like that. Like in Game of Thrones where it's just green fire. It was kind of like that. Greek fire was often used in naval battles and set enemy ships ablaze in four minutes or less. And its use was a significant factor in the success of the Byzantine Navy. The exact ingredients and recipe for Greek fire, like I said, they have been lost to history. And its composition remains a subject of debate and speculation among historians. Let's hope we don't find this one. I don't know. Let's find some pharaohs, mummies, tombs, treasures. That's great. Some guy's like, oh, the recipe for liquid lava that we can shoot at people. Awesome. Let's do it. Number three, the Vinland Mountain. Map. The Vinland map, this one's fun to all the toptographers, topographers, toptographers, map people. This one's for all the map fans out there. The Vinland map is a medieval map that depicts parts of North America, including a region known as Vinland. Not to be confused with Vineland, that's pretty good, I, that's a fun one. Vinland is believed to have been visited by the Norse explorer Leif Erikson around the year 1000. Now the map was first discovered in the 1950s and it's believed to date back to the 15th century. Buster rhymes, I'm like, huh? However, its authenticity has been the subject of ongoing debate among scholars and historians because, you know, it's like Atlantis. Some have argued that the map is a forgery while others believe that it's a genuine medieval artifact like the Shroud of Turin with, you know, Jesus's selfie. This is amazing. I have to say I believe this was once a real place. Sure, why not? The amount of pharaohs and leaders, dictators, all these people throughout history lost in books that have been burnt. Of course there are places and maps that have also been lost to history. Or maybe I've watched too many national treasure movies. Could be, could be the latter. It's probably that too. Number two, the dancing plague. Alright, this one's fun. Hit that like for step up two fans. So it's gonna be real sick. July 15, 18, one of the most bizarre dance circle slash plague events, who knows really, in medieval history went down. It was the craziest dance circle all of history, I have to have to admit. The dancing plague. Yeah, why can't this be the plague that comes back now? Why it had to be the one that was gross, everyone's coughing on each other. Why could we all just be popping and locking in the streets in 2020? Would have been way better. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and collect one summer, back in 1518, until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance or convulse uncontrollably in the streets. Others soon joined her, which is the weird part, and eventually over 400 people were all dancing the days away or convulsing, one of the two. It's really tragic. See, this was not a good time. It's, you know, we call it the dancing plague. You're like, oh, they were all dancing in the street. No, it was a nightmare. People are like seizing on the ground. Seizing? Seizing? People are seizing on the ground. It was tragic. A good amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion alone. The authorities, they tried their best to help out the situation. They uh, they paid for musicians to perform for them while they convulsed, which is just the thing you need back then. They're like, oh my god, what's happening? Quick. They just played music. They're like, this makes it way better. This is so fun now. No, it was horrible. Everyone was sick. This was a disease. This happened a few times in Europe, believe it or not, between the 14th and 17th centuries, and we still don't know 
what exactly happened. All we know is that it was some sort of illness and that it was not like step up two. Apparently it was not sick, nor 3D, nothing like that. And finally, number one, no insults. This one here is great. This would change the game today. If we brought this one back, so good. I can't whistle, but. It'd be like that. If you hurled insults at somebody back in medieval times, they were entitled to compensation and they could summon everyone else who's around at the time to be a witness. Yeah, if you spoke bad of someone during the Viking Age, even if the person wasn't there, it could ruin their reputation. And because of that fact, you now need to pay them for the possible damages you caused with your words, with your sick, nasty words. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. Your reputation was how you gained employment back then, it's how you met friends, and it was really important. It was an important thing not to be messed with. Also, if you insulted one man, apparently you insulted his entire family as well. So it's like that Vin Diesel kind of fast and furious families everything vibe where with one person, they're all coming at you. It was rough. There were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said it. I don't even want to know which words that was. Sometimes you went a little too far spreading lies, so they had to make it a capital punishment. Now, thou shall not talk smack. Get out of here. Starting our list off at number 10. Don't steal crops. In medieval times, stealing crops was considered a very serious crime. As funny as it may seem in your head. See a guy grab a vegetable and run away. Crops were a vital source of food and income for farmers and communities. There's no Uber Eats back then, all right? Somebody steals your tomatoes, you're fucked. In some cases, the punishment might be a fine or a restitution paid for the victim, while in more serious cases, the thief might be subjected to public humiliation or physical punishment, such as whipping or branding. Yeah, branding somebody publicly, all because you ate the wrong apple off the wrong tree. Repeat offenders might, of course, face more severe punishments because something's afoot here, okay? We're not buying your story this time. Such as imprisonment or banishment from the community. Yeah, banishment. Just get out of here. Next village. See ya. Overall, stealing crops was not taken lightly in medieval society at all, and it could result in significant consequences for the offender. Branded, getting branded because he stole a crop. That's embarrassing almost. Number nine, don't steal at all. Yeah, let's rewind the clocks back a bit more. Don't take anything ever. How's that sound? Sweden's Bjarki laws were a set of Viking era laws that governed maritime trade and piracy. Now, they were enacted in 832 AD, pretty old school, and they included punishments for various crimes, including theft and piracy. The punishment for stealing in a Viking society, it of course varied depending on the severity of the crime, the value of the stolen goods, and or the social status of the offender. But for minor thefts, the offender might be required to pay restitution or make amends to the victim. This could involve returning the stolen goods, paying a fine to them directly, or performing a service for them, you're basically a slave for them. For more serious offenses, such as repeated thefts or stealing from a chieftain, a chieftain, the punishment might be more harsh. And this is where we get into the nitty gritty of our list. Here, the offender might be stripped of their social status, exiled from the community, or even, yeah, killed, the worst of the worst. Now, in some cases, the punishment for stealing could also involve public shaming. That in the Viking era, I didn't want to know what that would look like. The offender might be paraded through the community or subjected to other forms of humiliation. Yeah, we'll get to the lung stuff a little bit later on. Slowly but surely, we'll get there. You have to start at theft and then work our way to the lunging and the horrible knee-breaking stuff. Number eight, arson. Capital punishment was a common punishment for arson in the medieval age. Sounds a bit harsh, but hear me out. Last time I was on this channel, I was talking about the Great Fire of 1666. It took 15 lives, but ultimately this fire, it forced officials to rebuild a great part of the city, restructured everything. This changed history. Fire in medieval towns equals trouble. It's gonna spread quite fast. A lot of wood, a lot of woody stuff. So if you were found guilty for arson, well, buddy, you're screwed. Arson, the deliberate setting of fire to property, it was considered a serious crime and was often punished severely in order to deter others from committing similar crimes, right? In some cases, arsonists were killed by hanging or they were burned themselves at the stake. Yeah, burning at the stake was a particularly gruesome form of capital punishment in which the accused was tied to a post or a stake and then they were set on fire. Again, this is all a public affair. People came out to watch this. Horrible, horrible. Hide your... Hide your eyes, we're not gonna watch this one. Number seven, amputation. While amputation was not a common punishment in Viking societies, there are historical accounts of it being used in extreme cases of punishment, which is absolutely crazy. I'll tell you two of them. One example is the story of Orm of Lyre, who was a wealthy farmer in Norway during the 11th century. Now Orm, old Orm here, he was accused of multiple killings, including the killing of a chieftain and was sentenced to have his hands and his feet 
amputated. Yeah, you can't kill anyone when you don't have any mitts, apparently. This was a severe punishment that was reserved for the most serious of the most serious, and it was intended to permanently disable the offender and hopefully prevent them from committing further crimes. Example number two, Edvin Kniffri. He was a wealthy farmer, again, another farmer in rough times. He was a wealthy farmer in Iceland during the 10th century. Now, Edvin, he was accused of stealing cattle, and as a punishment, his nose and his ears were cut off. Do you hear that? That's Edvin's ears getting cut off. It's horrible. I can't show it, but I can definitely act it. This form of punishment was intended to publicly shame the offender and serve as a warning to others. Yeah, I see Edvin over there. Old non-ear Edvin. That's why you don't steal. Number six. Slavery. Slavery, of course, was a common practice in Viking or medieval societies, and it was often used as a punishment for crimes such as theft, piracy, and debt. As I said earlier, if you steal enough stuff, you owe people far too much. Now they own you. According to the Bjarki laws, a set of Viking era laws governed in, you know, 832, I mentioned that earlier as well, individuals who were unable to pay their debts could and will be sold into slavery. Yeah, you gotta pay some way. Vikings also engaged in the slave trade. They captured individuals during these raids and they sold them as slaves in markets across Europe and the Middle East. Slavery was an integral part of the Viking economy and many Viking households had slaves actively who were performing various tasks such as farming, household chores, and even military service. The treatment of slaves in Viking societies varied depending on the individual owner, but slaves were generally considered property and had few legal rights. Yeah, we don't look at that often when we look at medieval history. We often just imagine guys like me with big beards, you know? Number five, the ordeal by fire. Also known as trial by fire, this one's a little bit different than being burned at the stake. Dare I say it's a bit worse? I don't know, it's certainly gonna last longer, which is worse in my opinion. This one here was a Viking punishment that involved subjecting the accused, this individual, to a test of endurance we can call it. They had to walk barefoot over hot coals or they had to hold hot iron in their bare hands. The belief here was that if the accused was innocent, they would be unharmed by this boiling hot fire. Whereas if they were guilty, well then, and only then, would they burn and suffer. This punishment was not unique to Vikings. It was used in various forms throughout history, medieval history. It was uh, it was huge in medieval Europe. They, they loved that. They loved uh, ordeal by fire, so that was a good time. Ancient India as well, they would perform such a task. However, there's some evidence to suggest that the Vikings may have used the ordeal by fire as a form of punishment and trial. For example, the Icelandic sagas, which are a collection of stories and history from medieval Iceland, they describe the use of ordeal by fire in legal proceedings, which Again, imagine being born in that era. Like, this is what you have to go and watch. I can't even watch UFC. I can't watch this guy burn, are you kidding me? In one story, a woman was accused of adultery and then she was forced to walk barefoot over hot coals as part of her trial. Yeah, she emerged unharmed and was declared innocent, believe it or not. I choose not to believe that. I believe her feet were absolutely fucked, but hey, who am I? Number four, getting even. Taking another's life. Yeah, can't get much worse than that, can it? Nowadays, if you kill somebody, it's a bit different. Now you'll get out early with good behavior, and then Netflix will do four miniseries all about you. Yeah, nice. You get your own Netflix special. Love it. Back in the Bjarki laws in the medieval Viking era, taking another's life was considered one of the most serious crimes, and the punishment for doing so varied depending on the circumstances of the crime, but, well, it was all bad, wasn't it? Back then, if the killer was caught in the act, they could be killed, well, on the spot by the victim's family or by the community. Over in 14 minutes flat, everyone goes home. No trial, nothing. If the killer was caught after the fact, they were typically subjected to a fine known as a wear guild, which was paid to the victim's family as compensation for the loss of their dearly loved one. And if the killer was unable to pay the fee, they could be subjected to other forms of punishment, including exile or even execution. Exile was brutal as well. You were declared an outlaw, then you were banished from Viking society with no legal protections or rights. This often led to you living in the wilderness, and that's terrifying, and that's lonely, and that lasts a while, and that's horrific. In some cases, the victim's family could also choose to enact vengeance on the murderer themselves rather than relying on the legal system. This could lead to a cycle of violence and revenge known as a blood feud that could last for generations. That's crazy. That sounds like it's something from a Batman comic. A cycle of revenge that could 
last generations. My God, let it go, Bruce. Number three, treason. Treason was defined broadly and it could include acts such as plotting against the king or queen, engaging in rebellion or insurrection, or providing aid to the enemy during wartime. Don't be a little snake, basically. Just don't do any of the above. The punishment for treason varied depending on the specific circumstances of the crime and which country it was committed. Now, this one's quite broad. You never know where you're gonna get, basically. In some cases, the punishment could be as bad as getting hanged or drawing and quartering, which if you don't know, that would involve you being hung and then accused until nearly dead, and then disemboweling them and cutting off their limbs before displaying the body parts publicly as a warning to others. So it's, yeah, it's the worst thing you've ever heard, pretty much. In other cases, the punishment for treason could include imprisonment, which is the most normal sounding thing on this list, banishment, or simply a fine. Yeah, here you go, I'm gonna write that for you. Don't do that again. In some cases, the accused might be given the opportunity to plea for mercy and be granted a lesser punishment. I would plea so hard. I'd be the most pleasant, hard pleading peasant in all the land. That would be over so quick, I would beg. The severity of the punishment for treason reflected the belief that the crime was a threat to the stability and security of the state. And you can't really fuck with that. Medieval society highly valued loyalty to the monarch and the state and acts of treason were seen as a direct challenge to all of this loyalty. So as a result, treason was punished harshly in order to deter others from committing anything similar. Yeah, don't quit the medieval times anywhere, anytime, anyone, at all. Period. Number two, rats. In medieval times, rats were often seen as a symbol of disease and filth, and they were blamed for the spread of epidemics such as, you know, the Black Death, stuff like that gross little hairballs. As a result, rats were sometimes used in punishments in order to deter others from committing crimes because, well, they're disgusting. Nobody wants that to happen to them, right? One common punishment was to tie a rat to a person's body, place a metal bucket over top, heat up said bucket so the rat is then forced to burrow into the victim's flesh to escape. Pretty horrible, but it gets worse. Other punishments involving rats included throwing rats at a person's face, which kind of hilarious, kind of horrible, or forcing them to eat a live rat. Both of these sound like fear factor challenges. That is insane. You get caught stealing now, you have to eat a rat. Can you imagine that? So gross. I would rather do the time than have a rat get hucked at my face. Thank you so much, Judge. And finally, number one, the cup bearer. We'll finish with one of the worst jobs to have in medieval times. This one's not a punishment per se, but it's too funny to leave out. This job would make me so anxious. Oh my gosh. In medieval times, a cup bearer was a highly trusted servant in a noble household or court. Now the cup bearer was responsible for the care and presentation of the Lord or Milady's beverages, ensuring that they were of high quality and served in appropriate vessels. Vessels where you can do this a lot. I know kings and queens like to do this a lot when they're giving their monologues. The cup bearer was also responsible for monitoring the Lord or Lady's health as their beverage could be laced with, you guessed it, poison. Yeah, gotta watch out for that, I hope. The cupbearer was often a position of great influence and power as they, of course, had access to the lord or lady at all times and could potentially use their position to manipulate history and gain favor with the ruling class. That would suck one day, wouldn't it? You take a sip and you're like, Oh, that's actually poison. This one's my last shift. That really sucks. Didn't think that would happen today. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have heresy. Okay, I can admit when I'm wrong, and in the last video last week, I messed up. I said the wrong word when talking about spoiled queens. You guys pointed it out, yeah? I read your comments, okay? And now we're here to redeem ourselves. I'm learning, you're already smart, let's get into it. In medieval times, it could be dangerous to disagree. Nowadays, many people like to keep an open mind. There's so many cultures, beliefs, people think different things, and that is totally okay. But it absolutely was not okay in the Dark Ages. Oh no. In these times, if you held any kind of belief that could go against the teaching of the Christian church, you were seen as a heretic. Many leaders, whether kings or crusaders or even missionaries and merchants, especially from the late 11th century, fought to have Christianity take over in the Mediterranean world. People belonging to other faiths, such as Jewish and Muslim people, suffered persecution and expulsion. In England, there were massacres, and in the late 12th century, Edward I banned all Jewish people from England. I mean, this quite literally set the stage for the Spanish Inquisition in 1478, which was aimed at establishing Spain as a united single 
single Christian faith. Wars in medieval Europe weren't just waged on people of different faiths, however, it was also aimed at some Christians who people believed to be heretics. This is all to say that heresy was a serious crime in these times, and thinking outside of what you were told to think at the time and what was accepted could have landed you a death sentence. Number 9. Facial Expressions I can't grow facial hair. I'm not sure if you noticed that watching, but it's never happened. It's not gonna happen. Quite frankly, I don't have to worry about trimming a beard early in the morning, anything like that. Which is fine, to be honest with you. I I'm not really complaining. Back in the medieval ages, I would have been set. People would have been pretty, I don't know, would have been more than ideal. The no hair look was the way to do it. The forehead was seen as the central point of your face, so it was common back in the medieval times for individuals to pluck all of their eyelashes and remove their eyebrows completely. So people would just be looking at you like, Nothing going on, no facial expressions, just bald everything. Many would go as far as to pluck their hairline back even further so they have the round, oval, queen bald look. Imagine that, imagine everyone's bald in Game of Thrones. Think it'd still get the rankings that it does? Probably not, probably not. Macy Williams is just... In our number eight spot today, we have Animal Court. The history of animals being put on trial goes back pretty far as it is believed it has roots in ancient Athens, but it was definitely a common practice as recently as the 18th century. Courts would go after things like rats, weevils, flies, locusts, and serpents for damaging crops, and when punished, they weren't just liable for damages, they could be banished and excommunicated. Like imagine trying to banish a fly. This isn't where it ends though. In civil criminal court, they'd have livestock being tried for violent against humans. Like, I'm sorry, your honor, my client could not tell the prosecution that she didn't want to be milked because she's a cow. Kicking was the only way. As an example of a real animal court case, let's take it back to 1457 France. Villagers in a town witnessed a sow and her six piglets attack and kill someone. Terrible story, sounds absolutely horrifying to have to witness. In this day and age, animal control would be called and all of those pigs would likely put down. But not in these times. When this happened, all the pigs were sent to court. Like real court. There was a judge, two prosecutors, eight witnesses, and a defense attorney for the accused animals. Witnesses provided testimony that proved that the sow had most definitely attacked the person and was definitely responsible for the crime. The piglets, however, well, for them, testimony was a bit murkier. There wasn't a witness who actually saw any of the piglets do any actual attacking. They just had blood on them, which isn't necessarily a sign of their guilt. It just means that they were there. This is why the court, while they did sentence the sow to death, the piglets were exonerated for their role in the crime. It's very strange and now would be a very expensive system, but in those times, it really did work for them. Number seven, inns and taverns. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the difference. Yes, there's drinking in both, and yes, both of them don't smell so great. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably, whereas a tavern, not so much housing. More rough housing, if anything, if you catch my drift. Say you're passing by one of these taverns, right, Saturday night, you feel like grabbing some questionable ale from some questionable establishment? Well, you better come prepared. In the Middle Ages, you had to bring your own fork everywhere you went. Just a single, just one fork on your side, on your person, that's so gross. We didn't have a guy sitting in booth 11 doing roll ups all night, looking at you, just wishing that he didn't work there, right? This was the Middle Ages, you didn't have a fork. No one had forks. If you had a fork, you were lucky, right? You were the rich kid on the block with an in-ground pool. That was you if you had a fork. Steak knives also were only reserved for carvers, so until the 17th century, you were just poking around your meal until you had a bite-sized amount, and then you, but choke on it because it's all horrible. It's all chewy and horrible. In our number six spot today, we have the filth. If you lived in a city during this time in history, it would have been an absolutely filthy place to be. I mean, human and rats lived in harmony. Not harmony, re the plague. But things were so dirty, rats were everywhere. Want to go swimming in the nice stream nearby? Huh, well, good luck, because not only is that body of water used for dumping sewage, but it's also for the village's water supply to both drink and bathe in. Disease was plentiful, obviously, and it spread exceptionally quickly. Spreading disease was even easier considering how all of the homes were packed full of people and no one really knew anything about hygiene and the benefits yet. 
health and otherwise. If you were to go out in the evening, especially at past curfew, it was also an insanely huge risk. Going out ran you the risk of getting killed or robbed with no police on the streets to help protect you at all. While city living provided a bit of safety in numbers situation compared to the countryside and also provided more opportunities to make money, it was still quite a risky place to live during the dark ages. Number five, teeth worms. Awesome, you have any cavities? Now you're gonna be looking this whole video. Dentists weren't common back in the dark ages, but they did have a barber. So I guess we're good for a few hundred years. This guy did it all. Cavities, toothaches, teeth, worms, gross, you name it, he'll pull it out violently. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, your classic three-in-one appointment right there, really all in 10 minutes or less. Instead of brushing with tooth tunes, back then you would rub your teeth and gums with a rough linen. Yeah, just grab an old shirt, it's an old dirty shirt, we're gonna brush up for school. Like you're playing a harmonica, only dirty shirt. A few recipes have been discovered since for pastes and powders to freshen their breath back then, you know. Otherwise, you were pretty screwed, you had nothing. We went from powdered charcoal to charcoal toothpaste all over again. What a weird loop we did. Mouthwashes were also made from herbs and spices steeped in wine or vinegar, so fresh breath guaranteed, no doubt about it. In our number four spot today, we have the stripes ban. We've all met someone before who seems to be concerned with what other people are wearing, and we jokingly refer to them as the fashion police. But back in the dark ages, you might come across some very real fashion police who are actually interested in fining you, should your finest tunic not be of the local dress code. Sometimes it wasn't even just a fine. Some serious fashion faux pas could lead to your imprisonment or even your death. Stripes were definitely a main culprit in these times, as striped clothing was seen as a garment of the devil. I'm not even exaggerating either. In the year 1310 in a French town, there was a local cobbler who was put to death because he had been caught in striped clothes. Yeah, we thought the tabloids were harsh, and I mean, they are, but the medieval fashion police were unforgiving. Not only were members of clergy not exempt from this rule, but neither were animals. Yeah, calling all zebras. Good luck out there, man. This is why zebras were called beasts of the devil. And yes, this is even though the people of Europe hadn't even seen them just heard tales of their striped nature. Number three, no rules football. In honor of the World Cup coming to a close, we have to take a look at football back in the late 12th century. Yeah, what did that look like? Or feel like, rather? Instead of corner kicks and throw-ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve the ball from the opposing team. Yeah, anything. Left hooks, some kicks, some jabs, throwing rocks, anything, you name it, it was violent. No diving in these games, I'll tell you that for free, you didn't have to. There was also no time limit. <clears throat> there was also no limit to how many players could be involved. So choose your team wisely, pick the biggest guy, pretty much. It's town versus town a lot of the time. There's a lot of emotions out there settled on the field. And in the middle of it somewhere, there would be a soccer ball rolling around. I would call this a sport. Now finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. And yeah, more than fair. Pause civilians and citizens are dying. He's like, yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's not wise. I don't know. In our number two spot today, we have fast medieval marriage. There are so many messed up medieval marriage practices. We could do an entire video on just that. And in fact, we have. Go check those out. But while you're here, let's talk just a bit about them. Marriage in the medieval times was quick and easy, but also difficult to prove. If you and your loved one wanted to get married, all you really needed to do was say, we're married, and then boom, it's done. Of course, this led to a whole pile of those spur of the moment type marriages, especially considering how sex before marriage was widely condemned in these times. You know, people are like, eh, it. We're married now, let's do it. Well, I'm pretty sure many people who were divorced would have preferred if their marriages were this easy. This led to people, of course, taking advantage of this difficult to prove thing. Most especially women would often fall victim to a man who might want to take you as his wife for the night. But then the following day, after getting what he wants, he denied ever agreeing to the union of the two. If you're catching my drift. This is why many women tried to get at least one witness to union, just in case. And finally, number one. Pointed shoes. This one's so fun. Whenever I see anything that's related to the medieval times, I always admire the attire, right? Especially the shoes. I hate buying shoes today so much. Now they're so specific. You got walking, running, trail shoes. They're always so expensive. Nobody does it like the medieval times anymore. Specifically, Krakows. Krakows were awesome. They were the style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century Europe that looked really ridiculous. They had the long 
huge long nose that went out really high. They're so silly looking, maybe that's why I love them. These log toed shoes first appeared in the 12th century, but the cacao, the thing is, these things were twice as long as your foot, and that was considered fancy back then. These meant business, so you better watch those ankles, Beth, all right? We're going into some meetings. Fast. They were named after the city that they were made in. Krakows were worn by everybody at one point, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the more valuable you were. There we go. So it turned into a joke eventually, right? These things got way too long and it looked ridiculous. You ever walk around in flippers beside the pool where you do that big silly walk? That's the walk that everybody was doing in town, right? It was out of hand. They would be stuffed with horse hair or moss. Yeah, which is just as comfortable as Dr. Scholl's. Imagine stepping around in moss all day, yuck. Also, sometimes a string would be needed to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee just to keep these damn things afloat. So everybody at one point in time, in the medieval times, looked like a Muppet tied to strings. How amazing is that? Do you own any Krakows? If so, how do we get our hands on a pair? I'm a size 11 and a half Krakow. Let's make it happen. Maybe if we all pitch in as a community. I don't know, we can all be wearing Krakows tomorrow. So, in at number 10, we have witch marking. I'm trying to avoid some things we've already covered in similar videos, so while we've discussed witches, let's talk about witch marks. So during the English and Scottish witch hunt days, there was a belief that witches always had a natural skin mark. This could be a mole, or a scar, or a pock mark, or even a really bad zit. So, when they came across a woman whom they thought were a witch, but she didn't have any of those markers, that was the end of it, right? She isn't a witch? Well, no, they gave her a skin mark instead, specifically by using a pricking needle, which the witch hunters would carry. These needles repeatedly pricked the flesh of the accused until it produced the result that wouldn't bleed, but was insensitive to pain, which fulfilled the criteria of a witch's mark. It's a subtle punishment for something that they were yet to be accused of, because by giving them the mark, they could now accuse them. These witch hunt days were a whole mess. Number nine is marking your territory. Not in a cool, sexy, I got a tattoo way, more in a scarlet way kind of way. As you'll learn in this video, a woman who cheated or even was single and just engaged in intercourse of her own free will could be classified as a sinful adulterer and cheater and be punished, usually a lot worse than a man. So when Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote The Scarlet Letter, he took inspiration from real life events. The letter, which for the character Hester Prynne was just a red A, was usually the letters AD, which stands for adultery, as outlined by the Plymouth Colony Law in 1658. Multiple accounts across Europe verify that someone who was being marked was to be seen out in public without it, could be subject to public whipping and other public humiliations that ensured a person's social alienation. Like in the Scarlet Letter, when Puritan minister Arthur refuses to admit his sinful side of the act with Hester, he's branded with an A in his chest. In a man's case, while this was of course painful, it was allowed to be hidden. He also didn't have to face the societal consequences the way any woman would have. For number eight, we travel to discuss status degradation. While it still persists today, not everyone knows what it means. So essentially, you do something wrong, oopsies, you lose some of your basic human rights. You could steal something, have relations out of wedlock, cheat on your partner, miss some work. Every empire that has used this tactic has had a variety of ways that you could mess up and receive this punishment. Naturally, in times where a woman was property and couldn't buy things, own things, or do things, or breathe without having a man side eye her for it, this was a monumental punishment to receive. Under the Roman Empire, Augustus, who reigned from 27 BCE to 14 CE, a woman guilty of adultery could lose several rights as a citizen and suffer a financial burden. Noblewomen in the Kingdom of Korea during the Chosan Dynasty faced a similar degradation of their societal status if they were found guilty of remarrying as a widow. This intentionally made it hard for Korean women to remarry as they would have nothing to offer a new husband, no inherited lands or funds, and a societal belief deemed her as used goods. Even the descendants of widows at the time who had remarried faced status degradation. They were barred from ever holding office. Adulteresses in the Chosan were stripped of many of their rights and privileges once they were demoted to low-born statuses. As serious as these punishments may seem, some high-status women who committed adultery in the Chosan dynasty faced an even graver punishment, which was death. So why take someone's status from them as a criminal punishment? Well, because it's aside from the fact as a woman you'd essentially be left jobless, homeless, and without any family, it's because of a cheater's fama, number seven. While fama is a Latin term for reputation and good name, 
same, every country had its own version of this fama. And if you cheated or were even just accused of cheating in 13th century France, which by the way happened a lot because husbands just want to get rid of their wives, the woman was always the center of the punishment, even if that was the man who had been cheating. This is because the status is all a woman ever had for a very long time, and the name of her family's reputation laid on her shoulders. Thus, all that pressure to be religious, virtuous, and most importantly, a submissive woman. The customary laws of Agen province list public humiliation for both the wife and her lover as the appropriate punishment for adultery. If the man could escape before or even after arrest, he could get off without any punishment and his partner had to face her punishment alone. The woman got no such reprieve, even if she was just the mistress he cheated on his own wife with. In fact, if she tried to escape arrest, it warranted a death sentence. Women whose fama suffered through public shaming walk of atonement were no longer deemed honorable members of society and seeing as standing of individuals before law at the time was often based on their reputations, what others thought of them and how they behaved in public, she'd be left, as I said, homeless, familyless, and dejected. For my Game of Thrones people, think Cersei. Number six is no protection. Get your mind out of the gutter. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, there's no protection from capital punishment. While civil laws were easier to work around by just getting married alone, you can borrow money or property, you can buy things that you couldn't before and sign contracts, the criminal law didn't bend to a married woman as she faced the same penalties as an unmarried one. Now, there are technically one exception, pregnancy, but only because it could potentially be a boy, which is insane. Additionally, all women were exempt from certain torts, such as the breaking wheel. But man, when a woman got capital punishment, it was the one and only form, and it was the most brutal and painful one, burning at the stake. By the way, they claim this was the only and the necessary option of execution for a woman, as it's a preservation of female modesty. Apparently, other forms of execution were unbecoming of a woman. Although there may be some truth to this wild justification, modern historians have rounded it down to just misogyny, as well as a deep-rooted suspicion and dislike of women as the root of this execution decision. Essentially, when given the opportunity to punish a woman, men went ham for it and wanted to see her suffer as much as possible. So women experienced the worst executions of the Dark Ages. Number five is why women want to stay in religious favor. In medieval Europe, a device was literally invented for women who defied their religious beliefs. Pyramid shaped and made of wood, the woman who dared to defy her god should fear this. See, they would bind the woman's hands and ankles and then sit one of her two genital openings on the peak of the pyramid. She would then be incapable of shifting her weight anywhere else and was forced to put her weight down on the tip. It would slowly slide upwards and inwards and the longer she was pressed down on it, the more her body split apart. These women would be left for days on end sometimes on this device. The device's slow, agonizing death can be compared only to the shame it inflicted as well. The woman was stripped nude and forced to suffer this torture in public for all to see. Number four is harems. To start, the word harem is derived from the Arabic word harim, and it often means sacred, forbidden, and sometimes sanctuary. This was an accurate name for, as only women's household members and some related male members were allowed to enter a harem, which was an honored women's space. The harem was ultimate symbol of a sultan's power, his ownership of women, Women, mostly slaves, was a sign of wealth, power, and sexual prowess. The seclusion from public gaze also inflated this power more so. But a royal harem could be a place of filth and stink where chaos and emotions ran high. This was the price of being property. Used by the emperors and his sons, you could either be favored or so hated that one day you vanish and rumors of your exile whirl amongst your peers. These ladies usually did not have the liberty to move out of the harem as they liked, but inside the harem they could move around as they pleased. There was no sisterhood in them either. So Socializing amongst themselves was usually not friendly and jealousies were shown directly. Makes sense, as status and position of authority in the harem were determined by the place that they had in the emperor's favor, and to give the king his first male child was a great competition in this regard, resulted in unpleasantness through the royal harem. Everyone tried their best to please the emperor and turned her bad qualities like jealousy, aggression, or short-tempered attitude onto other women. Seeing as many of these women were stolen from outside the empire, let alone inside, frustration with language barrier and culture clash was also a huge source of contempt. Sometimes the women would lie to the sultan to have others disposed of, or they'd simply gang up on one another. Regardless, harems were places of drama, inequality, and a race to be favored as a ticket out of sexual 
servitude. Hidden sexuality is number three. There were plenty of mainstream laws in medieval and middle Europe against male homosexuality, and while it wasn't considered as serious, lesbianism still posed a threat to the ideals of a male-centric societal order. A law written in 1260 France stated that women caught engaging in homosexuality shall undergo mutilation on her first and second offense, and on her third, she must be burned. This is one of the only laws to specify consequences for lesbianism, but the 13th century and Christian perspective of sex radicalized further into modesty. Lesbianism was equated to sodomy at that time point and therefore carried a similar sentence, death. There is sufficient evidence of lesbians in middle ages, most of which come from the church. Turns out many nuns were sexually active lesbians and the church directly acknowledges their presence by having to pass laws establishing penalties for nuns caught having sexual relations with each other. So not only were they having sexual relations with each other, but it was enough that the church had to do something about it. For example, during the 8th century, Pope Gregory III gave penances of 160 days for unnatural female acts. Still, no torture or death though, this is because as long as phallus or other phallus shaped objects weren't used or involved, the relationship wasn't considered real intercourse. Real intercourse involved procreation after all. So eventually, when Christianity upped the ante however, any sexual act that caused pleasure, which now included lesbian in intercourse or plain old self stimulation, was now considered sin. So like most women of the Middle Ages, even bisexual and lesbian women had to settle down for a man at that point. Anyone who struggled with sexuality can imagine how dreadful it would be to live that way. Divorce was a nightmare, which is why it's number two in our countdown. Laws worldwide were unforgiving of divorces, literally always to the woman. In Chinese laws, a woman could only divorce her husband if he mistreated her family, not even her. He on the other hand could divorce her for anything. Some accepted grants for divorce were failure to bear a son, evidence of being unfaithful, lack of piety to the husband's parents, theft, suffering a virulent or infectious disease, jealousy, and talking too much. A pretty superficial list, but in Chinese society, divorce was a serious action with social repercussions for both parties, so consequently divorces were not as common as they may sound. She could not be divorced if she had no family to return to or if she had gone through the three year mourning period for her husband's dead parents. And speaking of family, during the Han Dynasty, unmarried women brought a special tax on their family and women with babies were given a three year exemption from the tax and their husbands a one year, so there was a huge push to get married. Meanwhile in medieval England, their similarities are stark. They too had a small number of divorces despite an expansive list of reasons to do so, such as there was a discovered blood relation between the individuals, or impotence, or fear used to obtain consent, marriages entered into under false pretenses, things like that. In many of these cases, the lack of sufficient evidence made them difficult to prove and thus deterred people from taking their cases to court. And number one is the tradition of foot binding. It existed for around 10 centuries and there are women alive today who still have feet that are the result of feet binding. Foot binding involves systematically breaking the feet and shaping them inwards. This tradition started in the five dynasties 10 states period of the 10th century when beloved concubine of the emperor built a guild lotus flower stage and performed a dance on bound hoof shaped feet. Being a beloved concubine, the other concubines of the emperor attempted to imitate her feet to curry his favor. So foot binding began within the royal court and spread through China as the next fashion fad. It's done in a ritualistic ceremony accompanied by a variety of traditions to ward off any bad luck. They began by tucking the toes under the feet and using a long tight ribbon wrapped up to the ankle to hold it all in place. Anytime the foot grew, they broke it inwards more, a process usually taking two to three years. The foot would remain bound for the rest of a woman's life. There is a whole list of issues this caused. Outside of extreme agony and being a handicap, it caused some women pain for the rest of their life. Their walk was changed, as was their posture, and the idealism of a slim body to lighten the pressure on one's feet was all the rage. The binding of feet actually caused the women to develop strong muscles in their hips, thighs, and buttocks, so much that the characteristics were considered physically attractive to Chinese men of the area, aka the girlies were thick. When colonization came to China, Western women boycotted foot binding, going as far as to catch women with bound feet and cut off their bindings. A humiliation because these women would never ever show their bare feet to anyone, let alone even husbands. And many of these women lost their husbands when the Western boycott worked. A lot of girls who had had their feet bound in order to become marriageable suddenly found themselves abandoned by their husbands because foot binding was no longer fashionable at all. Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. 
Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chain mail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages. Pretty dark. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the Dark Ages? Where do we put them? What do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around. So now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the Dark Ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plague souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights and you know the dark ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well, as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a knight and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early and attend court, like a noble, like royal court, where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like, what a joke. I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like, these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage apparently but instead of just you know setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever they just took them to court a real court like a real trial there was a judge a couple prosecutors eight witnesses a defense attorney for the pigs which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that that's a t terrible job that's one of the worst jobs ever I, I lightly introduced here these pigs were then hung from a gallows tree it was so horrible the dark ages dark right a knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. <laughs> this is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just eh, moving through towns. Like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns, moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense. So it was a, you know, horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches. Oh, so close. Number six, 
jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel, or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was was no funny business, that was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go, just show up and fart and be funny. Have all this land. That's like a kingdom, you have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. It's crazy, you just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family, thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. Number five, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, I had good benefits. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII and this role was to assist the king and specifically assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed said box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom o the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps, thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history, maybe. We're almost there, you'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was the that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of, you know, dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other, like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't have any, uh, any toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know? Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show, getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar. They would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow remover would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest, wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. It's poor soul. And finally, number one, the rat catcher. 
Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks, and they have like cool rat friends. That's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something, and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats, and they were also like tucked away. And then historically, they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part, which in this case was your chest or abdomen. It was horrible, it was an absolute nightmare. But these rats had to come from somewhere, or rather, someone. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in, or rather, out of a castle. It's an important role, you know, just like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease, and with these castles being big and dark, there were probably a lot of them hiding. Black rats were a common household problem, so we need to get those out. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of the rats. Wasn't always helpful, wouldn't work. More often than not, didn't work. So poison powders were the next main trick here. Also the Pied Piper, he was an OG. Historically, he would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher, actually, today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. Number 10, carrying a sword. Whenever we see medieval shows or hear stories or see art, everybody always has a sword at their side. I'll admit, on one hand, literally, it's pretty badass. Was this really that common, though, in the 12th century? Was everyone gifted a sword on their 16th birthday, like in Zelda Wind Waker? No. No, of course not. I mean, if you were traveling, sure, ideally you'd want a little dagger or a little something to help you out, but swords were a symbol of wealth and status. And the bigger and shinier the tune, the better, right? On average, these things would cost you seven months worth of wages. So you best start saving up and training. Yeah, you might want to train as well because these things were not light. No, not at all. Ideally, medieval swords would weigh three to four pounds. Doesn't sound like much at first, but I know after eight minutes, I would be switching arms real quick. It's like when you hold your hand up in class, you're like, oh God, what's going on here? Gotta do some push-ups. In our number nine spot today, we have the death cage. If you were to take a look at the punishments used in history, it quickly becomes clear that people of the past just really liked watching people die or have pain inflicted upon them. It's very strange, it's very dark, and it certainly is not for the faint of heart. The death cage is just one of the many horrifying punishments used during the dark ages. Essentially, this was just one method of execution that was extremely public, as they would strip the person down and lock them in an iron cage that was placed somewhere that everyone would be able to see. From here, the condemned person would be locked in there with no food or water, and everyone would just watch as they slowly died. Unbelievably messed up for a multitude of reasons, for sure. Sometimes, to make matters even worse, however, the condemned person would also be slathered in milk and honey, so that they would also be attracting insects, just to make the whole dying process even worse. It's all bad. I'm just thankful that those days are over. Number eight, the summer of 1348, AKA the Black Death. Now let's talk about this horrible event, shall we? If you thought summer 2020 sucked, well, buckle up, this one was pretty bad too. The bubonic plague traveled, the bubonic plague arrived to medieval England in 1348 and the death toll here was absolutely devastating. Somewhere from one third to half of England's population gone, just like that, and that's it. The plague hit hard and it hit fast. Now today we have variations of the virus, the one we shall not name, but back then the plague was a bacterium now known as Yersinia pestis. Now symptoms were quite jarring. You got lumps in the groin or your armpits, so that can't be comfortable. And next, the infected would notice black spots appearing all over their body. Almost all that were infected died within three days. More often than not, without a fever, so you wouldn't see it coming, aside from the black spots and the things I just said. Now, the drop in the population resulted in a widespread of wealth. Workers were demanding higher wages, and farmers were demanding lower rents. The poor got expandable income, so it kind of kind of helped, kind of didn't. I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. The Black Death spread more than a mile per day, and it's all thanks to traders and travelers. Yeah, humans can't stay still for a bit. We love traveling, even through the Black Death. Because, you know, why not? Roads are empty. As long as there aren't any rats hiding on board, maybe you'll make it. In our number seven spot, today we have the meowing nuns. Mass hysteria wasn't necessarily uncommon in the dark ages. There are a few instances we could discuss, but for today I want to talk about one of my favorites.
appearance. In the book, The Epidemics of the Middle Ages, which was written by J.F. Hecker in 1844, there was the description of a very strange case of mass hysteria that broke out among nuns in a French convent in the Middle Ages. Basically, one day a nun in this French convent started to meow like a cat. I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how this started, all I know is that it happened. And you know what else happened? Other nuns in the convent began to also meow like cats. Eventually, it became such a thing that all of the nuns in the convent would meow together for a certain period of time. And of course, everyone surrounding this area was like, what in the absolute heck is going on right now? This is actually a huge problem because in these times, cats were hated. People associated cats with the devil and with disease. So a bunch of meowing nuns was like the equivalent of doomsday. Apparently, the way that this stopped was that the police came and threatened to whip the nuns if the meowing didn't stop, which is definitely one of the weirdest things I've ever said. Number six, peddlers. Ah yes, that medieval businessman just wandering along in the pine forest in hopes of not getting robbed, a classic image from medieval times. The Dark Ages were a dangerous game, right? So one could only imagine how hard it must have been for a merchant who travels the countryside for a living to sell goods. In Breath of the Wild, you're like, oh, thank God, there's that one guy with all the goods that I need. How convenient is this? Awesome. That's not in real life. In the Middle Ages, traveling village to village wasn't an easy task. You couldn't order an Uber and then voila, and unless you were a knight, you probably didn't have a noble steed to take you there. But even so, an outsider showing up to your village to sell goods from a distant land? I don't know, sounds a little sus if you ask me personally. Peddlers were more often than not welcomed with suspicion by locals. Most of the time, peddlers were just accused of being criminals, even if they weren't. Guy shows up, he's like, hey, wanna buy some watches? They're like, you're a robber, you're going away. In our number five spot today, we have donations. In the dark ages, it wouldn't necessarily be strange to either donate or sell your own urine. Yeah, the market was hot for urine because they used it a bunch during this time in history. Medieval chamber pots would collect all of the stuff from an entire household or public space wherever they were placed. And oftentimes they could later be sold at the local tanner or fuller in town. I mean, talk about an easy way to make some money, but how horrible. The reason this product was so popular is because it was used in a variety of ways. It could be used to clean clothing, to help with the dyeing process, to tan leather hides, and like I spoke about in a recent video, be used to help in the cotton making process in order to make the material soft and not frayed. While the practical uses make the wholesale process a little less peculiar, it honestly still would just be weird to have to sell your own pee or your neighbor's pee. Number four, color coordinated. I get it, on Wednesdays we wear pink. It's nice to add a little color into your schedule at work in the office. It's fun, sure, have at it. In medieval times, they were serious about their looks and colors. There was no fun around back then. Having rules about what colors and what type of clothing and hats you could wear, you named it. It was all based on your occupation or social level. Some colors were banned for certain professions. Imagine that. For example, imagine if you were a night worker, right? If I can say that, a woman lady of the night. You weren't allowed to wear certain styles or colors. That's hilarious. Hey, welcome to Ontario. We don't wear jeans here. Got it? All right, now get in. 15th century English law banned knights or anybody below knights from wearing velvet, which is so random to me and so funny looking back. Now imagine that. And you may know this one, but purple was a fancy color back then. Purple has been associated with royalty even since the ancient world. Natural purple dye was rare, and medieval Europeans believed that mixing dyes was unnatural and diabolic. It was a no-no. So they were missing out on purple for quite a while because they didn't want to, you know, mixed goods, if I can say that. In our number three spot today, we have divorce by combat. If you talk to most people who are divorced nowadays, they'll tell you about how awful the divorce proceedings can be. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and sometimes things get pretty heated. While these harrowing tales are definitely less than delightful, things could definitely be worse. And by worse, I mean you could be getting a divorce in the dark ages by way of combat. The first documented instance of this was created by Hans Talhofer in a 1467 manuscript. Manuscript. He wrote, quote, As per the instructions, the husband was put up to his waist in a three foot wide hole dug in the ground with one hand tied behind his back. The woman was to be armed with three rocks, each weighing between one and five pounds, and each one wrapped in cloth. Basically, the man couldn't leave the hole, but the woman could run around the edge of the pit. He continued on, quote, If the man 
man touched the edge of the pit with either his hand or arm, he had to surrender one of his clubs to the judges. If the woman hit him with a rock while he was doing so, she forfeited one of her stones. While this sounds like an insane process, it really was true and continued on before growing rare in the early 13th century. Not only has the discovery of this historical practice shed light on something we previously did not know, but it also gives us a glimpse into the gender dynamics of the time period. We're not entirely sure how this sort of divorce ended, but many speculate that this basically continued on until one of them died or one of them surrendered. Number two, bucket family style. For my last one today, we're getting real cozy. Real cozy. Remember in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when all his grandparents have to share that one rickety old bed? Well, that's what everybody at home looked like in the dark ages. Imagine being in the middle. I'm already anxious thinking about it, just stuck. I mean, think about it though. Back then, space was so limited. Warmth is also a plus in those winter nights. And beds, they were massive. They were made of straw and wood. It was a whole thing. It was a whole situation. It's not like you could fit more than one of these in your home. No way, Jose. Even in the royal household, this was a common theme. King Richard I of England and King Philip II of France both had to sleep in the same bed as an act of diplomacy. Again, I would be so anxious and awkward there. I'd be like, oh, excuse me, Mr. King guy. You're snoring too loud. In our number one spot today, we have affairs of the court. If you know anything about marriage in the Dark Ages, you know that love was often not a part of it. To sort of piggyback off my last point, if you were in a loveless marriage like most everyone else was in the time, but didn't want to go through the process of beating your spouse to a pulp or any of the other divorce methods at the time, you could instead turn to courtly love. This wasn't for the common household and instead was for members of the court, but it allowed the lords and ladies of the time to experience love and courtship despite what their marital status might be. Yeah. It was a place for married people to go and hook up. Well, not entirely. I mean, there of course were roles in place and society was very pious, so people weren't exactly hooking up. But it was a huge hit. People danced, they giggled, they flirted, and sometimes people could even be caught holding hands. One of the rules of courtly love just stated, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. Number 10. The Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like you're already the first man, you don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay and five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. Number nine, the Crusades. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in six million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the east. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings, the elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, 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 we need fear way more fear. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year is 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right that down. Except women. They don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? 
That's right, animals being tried in a court. A lively and popular event trying any law-breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathersworth, peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, Your Honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number seven, the Battle of Bannockburn. This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and roll our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death aka pestilence, aka the great mortality, or simply known as the plague. Single-handedly the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where bless you comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. I I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food. Should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead, but those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number five, Joan of Arc. Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages. Who'd have thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard my entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number four, Henry V. Another war? All these people do is kill each other. Does anyone fish? Or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment, Henry V, prologue, good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card, just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh uh, yeah, I play uh, mob football at Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm uh, 
I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number 2. The Printing Press The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text, mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be or not to be 86 more folios? <sighs> The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink because they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories all part of the mystery. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Treaty de Verdun was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom. And Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily I would just float near the net tap the ball away like nice try mm. back to prison mm. number eight stone masonry so we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stone masons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? 
Eh, uh, backwards, you idiot. I'm gonna put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the, I got it. We're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff and growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs, who were laborers, who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people, and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain in good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on. A three day work week? Plant a couple of carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, fear the dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently, this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic 
academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the Apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder, go, go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar wacky frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths, that's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up, it's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was a cult, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure, either way, we're all dancing. At number 10, fashion. Back in the Dark Ages, fashion and high quality clothing were a symbol of status in society. For the elite, it was their way of displaying their wealth and high status over the poorer population. Because this meant so much to them, obviously they had to go above and beyond with their looks and oh boy oh boy, did they take things to a whole new level. Everything was super exaggerated. For women, they just wore the finest dresses, but for men, that's where things got spicy. Male fashion was quite something. They would often wear dangerously short tunics with tights and belts to really snatch their waist, followed by the codpiece to really accentuate things down under, you know? But their shoes. Don't even get me started on their shoes. They wore some seriously pointy shoes, and to them, the longer and pointier, the better. Their elf looking kicks were really what screamed, I'm better than you, to the rest of the public. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with whalebone to keep their shape. These people looked pretty ridiculous, at least to our modern standards, but back then, wearing pointy shoes and tunics with the codpiece was like the equivalent to wearing a full Gucci fit. At number 9, helmeted chickens. In the dark ages, peasants didn't really get the best food. The good stuff was more so saved for the members of the elite, and these people ate some good stuff. I mean, to us it's weird, but to them, it was finger licking good. Speaking of finger licking good though, let me tell you about one of their weirdest foods, helmeted chicken. No, it wasn't a special chicken that was prepared with special ingredients or whatever. It was literally what the name is, a helmeted chicken, aka a chicken with a helmet on. I know, 
Weird, right? This was a theatrical dish to say the least. It featured a regular old cooked chicken that was stitched to a pig like he was riding on its back, and to add a special little something something, the cooks would fashion a tiny helmet to make it look like a guard or knight for whatever lord or king that they were serving this bizarre dish to. This was a fan favorite because of how extravagant it was, but that trend sort of lived and died in the dark ages because you can't catch any chef doing something like that these days. Gordon Ramsay would have a fit over this one. Before I carry on telling you guys about all the weird and crazy things that people did back in the dark ages, I would first like to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also consider subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Beautiful Death. Death was kind of a big deal in the dark ages. Sounds weird, but you also have to take into account the fact that the average life expectancy was only about 30 years old, so really, you didn't have long. Also, people back then were faced with some pretty harsh times like famine, cold, and of course, the Black Death. Because they had to face death so early on and so often, the so-called art of dying came to be. The whole premise behind the art of dying revolved around dying a good Christian death. According to those who lived in the Dark Ages, your death had to be planned and peaceful. When someone was on their deathbed, they would concern themselves with accepting their fate without quote, despair, disbelief, impatience, pride, or avarice. End quote. This art of dying thing was very popular amongst priests, and this actually led to a lot of painters at the time depicting people in holy professions as submissive to death and what was to come for them. At number 7, Feast of Fools. One of the more lively aspects of the Dark Ages was the many festivals and holidays that were celebrated. Though most of the population worked grueling hours for days on end, they often got breaks to hold celebrations. Most holidays and celebrations that were held were religious, but others were just silly and were designed for people to have fun, like the Feast of Fools for example. The Feast of Fools was held in early January and was inspired by the pagan festival of Saturnalia. This was a pretty interesting festival because it involved swapping the highest respected officials with serving maids and they became masters and were crowned kings of misrule. This festival first started as something confined to the church, but soon became a bigger affair with parades, comic performances, music, costumes, and even drag. These people really liked their festivals. Another pretty weird festival that they held was the Festival of the Ass, where a young girl carrying a child would ride on the back of a donkey into a church, and during the service, instead of saying amen, they would say hee haw like a donkey. I know, bizarre, right? At number six, soccer. These days, people regard soccer or football as a modern European sport, and though it is popular in these modern times, it turns out that the sport has been around a lot longer than you might think. Soccer was first played back in the Dark Ages, however, it is very different from the soccer that we know today. Back then, the sport didn't even really have a name, and there were no rules either. The only thing that people followed when playing the game was the objective of winning. Back then, you were allowed to win by any means necessary, besides deliberately offing people, of course. Back then, soccer became known as a pretty brutal sport. It was violent, chaotic, bloody, and sometimes even deadly. It involved an infinite amount of players, so it was really a free-for-all on the playing field. The sport was so intense that in 1314, King Edward II banned the game decreeing, quote, on pain of imprisonment, such games to be used in the cities in future, end quote. Glad things have changed since then because FIFA would be really intense if it hadn't. At number five, weddings. Marriage and weddings back in the Dark Ages were very different than they are today. Back then, because the average life expectancy was so low, people started getting married and having kids very young. Usually, girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, around the age of 12, and these marriages were not for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or for alliances. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriages just weren't as big of a deal back then as they are today, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. Most people didn't need permission to get married, so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies were held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was really married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. To make things even weirder, the consummation of marriage was also pretty odd because it wasn't a private affair. The act of bedding wasn't seen as an intimate moment between the couple, but rather an investment in the union, so it was observed by witnesses. I am certainly glad things have changed. At number four, jesters. 
You would think that being a court jester in the Dark Ages would have been a pretty bleak job, but you would actually be wrong. I mean, yeah, they looked funny with their outfits and hats modeled after the ears of a donkey, but jesters actually held a lot of power in court, making their job a pretty good one compared to other common folk. The court jester's job was to make people laugh by doing tricks, stunts, and telling jokes. Sometimes the jester would poke fun at the king or lord that they served, or would make comments about a kingdom's politics. And for a lot of people, saying these types of things would give them a one-way ticket to the gallows, but not the jester. Because of their profession, by royal decree, anything that they said was taken as a jest or a joke, so no one could get mad or offended at what the jester said or comments on. Basically, the jester was the one person in the court who was immune from medieval cancel culture. They could offend anyone they wanted to, and no one could stop them. At number three, unicorns and Jesus. The thing about the Dark Ages is that it was full of superstition and mythology. Within this period of time, there was a lot of confusion when it came to religion as paganism and the rise of Christianity were both hot topics. Many times, superstitions and mythology from paganism made its way into the religious beliefs of Christians and things were known to get a little weird. Take for example the unicorn and how it was incorporated into the Christian beliefs of the Dark Ages. It is believed that a mistranslation of what is thought to have been an ox is what brought unicorns into Christianity. Because of this mistranslation, the Bible likened Jesus to a unicorn. Since it was in religious texts, people in the Dark Ages sort of just ran with it, and so they started incorporating the unicorn into many religious artworks. To further this whole unicorn thing, they made up a superstition that only innocent maidens were allowed to touch unicorns, and they even used the unicorn to come up with a rather uncomfortable allegory of Christ entering Mary's womb. This unicorn thing was also fueled by the Vikings at one point, as during the medieval age, Vikings were known to con people into buying narwhal tusks marketed as real unicorn horns. At number two, divorce by combat. Back in the Dark Ages, if you wanted a divorce, you had to be willing to fight for it. Literally. In medieval Germany, couples would take to the ring to settle their disputes, and it was quite the showdown. Trial by combat was the common way of settling arguments back then, but when a husband and wife were fighting, things were a little more interesting than just having an all out brawl. During these divorce by combat proceedings, the husband had to stand in a hole with his hands behind his back, while the wife ran around in a circle with a bag full of rocks. I don't really see how this settled anything, but who am I to question the methods of the Dark Ages? And finally, at number one, Animal Court. I think that one of the weirdest things about life in the Middle Ages was their legal cases. As I just told you, their divorce proceedings were literally a trial by combat. They also found bizarre ways of trying someone if they were accused of witchcraft as well, and that was pretty dark, but the strangest court battles involved animals. Yes, animals were sometimes put on trial back in the Dark Ages. All animals from livestock to pets and even insects were not safe from the law and they would be put on trial if they were suspected of breaking the law. According to records from the Dark Ages, at least 85 animals were put on trial for a number of reasons. Pigs were the ones who were put on trial most often for chewing off people's body parts and even eating children. In 1474, a rooster was put on trial and found guilty of the unnatural crime of laying an egg, and even unwanted rats were put on trial and received strongly worded letters demanding that they leave the premises. The most bizarre case though involved a donkey who went through a legal trial and actually won. This donkey became the victim of unwanted advances, but was deemed innocent because someone declared her to be quote, virtuous and well-behaved animal, end quote. These people had way too much time on their hands. At number 10, shaming parades. If you've ever watched Game of Thrones, then you might be familiar with that scene where Cersei gets paraded through the streets of King's Landing while naked, while someone behind her rang a bell chanting, shame, ding, 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 shame. You know what I mean? It's kind of a meme, but it's also based on a real medieval tradition called shaming parades. For years, people have loved shaming others. I think it's just human nature at this point. And obviously, back then, they didn't have any social media to use as their preferred method of ripping on someone, so they got creative. Very creative. Depending on what the accused did, their punishment would vary. But the one thing that stayed constant was them being paraded through the streets for everyone to watch. Specific punishments were given for specific crimes. For example, if a tavern owner served bad beer, then they would be paraded through the street and forced to drink their bad beer. If they were caught stealing a pig, then they would walk through the streets with a dead pig around their neck and a crown made of pig's feet. How regal. 
People would throw things like glass, rocks, and even dead cats at whoever was being paraded, and it was quite the spectacle. Now, would you rather experience this or being canceled on social media? Let me know. At number nine, bloodletting. Back in the dark ages, medicine just wasn't the greatest. Clearly, I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe. Even their quote unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, so I'm not really sure I would trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get, so I don't think people were really complaining too much about their barber Joey down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was the practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent illnesses or diseases, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck out the blood of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I'm so glad that we do not do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside my body, thank you. Now before we carry on talking about just how weird things were back in the dark ages, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, maybe think about smashing that subscribe button as well to see more videos like this one. On number 8, day drinking. Day drinking is a thing. You know, when you're with the homies and you pour yourself a glass of sangria and take a walk around the neighborhood in the middle of the afternoon, not saying I've ever done that. It's usually a once in a blue moon type of deal, but for people in the dark ages, day drinking was an everyday affair. Now, people back then weren't necessarily drinking at all hours of the day just to get plastered and stay plastered. It was actually for health reasons. You see, people tried to avoid drinking the water at all costs over fears of illness because the water just wasn't clean and wasn't safe to drink, so they turned to the next closest thing that they could drink, and that just so happened to be alcohol. Back then, it was common to drink large amounts of beer, cider, or wine, and it was common to be drunk all of the time. Thank God we can safely drink water now because I don't think anyone could handle the hangover that came with all that heavy drinking. At number seven, no pleasure. The Dark Ages were heavily immersed in religion. In medieval Europe, they took Christianity very seriously and people followed the church very closely. The mission of people back then was to live a good Christian life and to not commit any sins, but one of those sins was a little unfortunate when you look back on it. Back then, any sexual acts that were meant for pleasure and not for procreation creation was considered a sin. That meant that sexy time was reserved for furthering the population and that's it. And if you did anything recreational, you would be getting a one-way ticket to hell. Along those same lines, it was also believed that female domination was also a sin and so the woman could not get on top, or again, straight to hell with her. One saint, Francesca Romana, was so afraid of experiencing pleasure when she slept with her husband that she literally burned her lady bits with hot fat so that it would make the experience as miserable as possible. That sounds horrible. At number six, cemetery fun. What types of things do you guys like to do for fun? Do you play video games or read? Or maybe you watch Netflix or YouTube, huh? And where do you like to go for fun? Maybe the mall or to your friend's house? Well, if you lived in the dark ages in Europe, you would go to the place that everyone goes for fun, the cemetery. Yep, you're gonna go kiki it up with the corpses and unfortunately they're not corpse husband, although corpse, if you're watching, hit me up. Thank you. Anyways, back in the dark ages, the cemetery was the place to be. It was considered to be the social hub of the community. Back then, people held theater performances, elections, trials, and even set up businesses in the cemetery because the graveyard shops were exempt from taxes. There was quite a lot going on in the cemetery, but it was almost the equivalent of going to the mall. But I want you guys to tell me if you would ever be like the people in the dark ages and just go to the cemetery for fun. I number five, an eye for an eye. When it came to the legal process in medieval Europe, things weren't always fair. I mean, they tried women for being witches and prosecuted animals for various crimes. Their punishments were sometimes swift and just, and other times, they weren't. People back then believed that when found guilty of a crime, there were worse punishments than losing a hand or something. As I mentioned a little earlier, they were quite fond of public humiliation, but they also believed in issuing fines and even kicking someone out of the community altogether. If someone was found guilty of a violent crime, then they would be subjected to punishment that would cause them pain as well, but not to teach them a lesson, but rather to brandish them so that they would be recognized as a person in the community who did that one thing to that one person, you know? Since 
these people were very religious. They also had to make up with God for whatever crime they committed as well. So usually that would involve fasting and then it would be up to Sky Daddy to determine if further punishment was needed. At number four, the king's evil. Being a king or queen in the Dark Ages might seem like a pretty cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another, they had to worry about their bloodlines, and of course, the thing that everyone had to deal with, illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil, and you're probably wondering, well, these kings weren't doctors, how did they cure illness? And to that, I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and they cured them. People thought that this was a miracle and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness because the monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. At number three, tooth worms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the dark ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only do they not have any proper medication or anesthetics, but you could also get the worst diagnosis your dentist could ever give you, and that was a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth to decay and that pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, is the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to rid the worm would be to take a candle made out of sheep's fat and various seeds, and then they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run from the heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the patient's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number two, judging tears. In modern times, somehow we've come up with this idea that only girls are allowed to cry. I think that's pretty BS and it's healthy for everyone to express their emotions, and funnily enough, they believed the same thing back in the dark ages. Back then, everyone was expected to cry freely, but the strange part of all this is the fact that people judged how others cried. Their tears would be judged on quantity, duration of crying, and frequency as well. They took their tears pretty seriously. Obviously, when someone was crying because of some kind of loss, it was pretty much nothing, but if they saw someone else crying for a different or unexplained reason, this was believed to have been a different kind of tears called the gift of tears. They believed that this was a sign that someone was thinking of Jesus and his suffering, and that they were so overcome with emotion that they were moved to tears, and this was also considered a gift from God. As long as someone's crying wasn't too loud, they didn't cry too much, and it didn't disturb anyone, especially during a church service, they were just considered particularly devout. And finally, at number one, pee readings. This dark age tradition is probably one of the strangest ones I have ever heard, and you might come to think the same thing. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do the practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they could judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color and that meant everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that your wine-colored pee is a bad thing. 